We're about to get started here. If you'd like to take a seat, please, Ms. Sanders. So you're saying you can't do that? I'm sorry? You, don't, you can't go outside the We're about to start our meeting here. We're actually late. So if you'd have a seat, please. Well, I guess our meeting is about all of us, not just people. <coughs> you know, I think if you have some disingenuous of you to not at least courteously tell the people that have come this evening that there's not enough room and why there is enough room. Can you extend that curtain? been assigned as a requirement by the state of Pennsylvania. Um, that requires 24-hour notice, and, and we just don't have the ability to do that. Uh, no. No. I, excuse me. I really, I, I, I need to ask you not to stand behind the board members. There's potential confidential information being displayed. We're asking that you please not stand behind board members. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Good evening. Could we have the roll call, please? Understood. We're, we'll call the police. Yeah, 
Rebecca. Here. Mrs. Fyrick? Here. Dr. Hessen? Here. Mr. Robinson? Here. Mr. Sanders? Mrs. San Martin? Present. Mrs. Schrader? Here. Dr. Sullivan? Here. Mrs. Turner? Here. Both members present. Thank you. This is our first opportunity this evening for public comment. All comments and questions will be addressed to the president. Board and staff members will not normally respond to comments or questions during our meeting unless recognized by the president for this purpose. Comments will be limited at the discretion of the president to five minutes or less. I assume you're at the microphone. We would, we would like your address and or township and your name for the record, please. Hi, my name is Lori Ehrlich and Spring Garden Township. <clears throat> Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I just wanted to apologize that I will need to run right out after I make my comments because I had a previous engagement tonight. But I delayed my event a little because I wanted to be sure to get here to show support. So what is the end game? That's the question I'd like to ask the folks in York Suburban School District who are using a disinformation campaign to try and shut down progress in the name of saving taxes. We moved to York 18 years ago. We chose the YS District because of its reputation for a quality education. And after all of these years, with one off at college and another child about to graduate, excuse me, can I please ask that people do not talk? Thank you. After all these years with one off at college and another child about to graduate, I can very happily say that they received just that. The educational opportunities at Suburban are top notch and I credit both the teachers and the administration for that. So why am I writing this comment? Because I'm in favor of progress. Even though my kids will not benefit from a new and improved intermediate school, nor will they benefit from improvements to the high school, I am still very much in favor of the district's building project. I have been following the progression of this project over the past decade. There have been lots of meetings, countless thoughtful discussions among our school directors and administration. They have invited public comment all along the way and have finally arrived at the most cost-effective way to solve the problems facing the aging buildings in our district. And if you had attended the district meeting held at East York in February, you'd have learned that the cost of simply renovating the two existing elementary schools is in the same ballpark as the cost of building a brand new intermediate center. And building new allows for much less disruption to the students attending these schools, and the outcome would be exponentially better in the long run. Joy rigging infrastructure and putting band-aids on two aging buildings does not bode well for the future of those buildings. And a new consolidated intermediate center will allow for more efficiency, thus saving money in the long run. From what I have learned reading the neighborhood websites, former school directors were very much in favor of this plan. This loud minority in our district who have been distributing flyers and sending out postcards that claim residents will have tax increases of $1,500 a year are using flawed math and incorrect data to come up with their conclusions. I have consulted with a few people in the financial industry and have used the tax calculator available on the YSSD website and have concluded that our tax increase will be nowhere near the number that these fear mongers are claiming. Does anyone want a tax increase? Of course not. Of course not. But historically, York Suburban has almost never maxed out their tax increases as allowed by the Act 1 index. So over time, residents have actually had a break comparatively. And we are far from the highest tax district in this county. So I ask again, 
What is the end game? Why try and stop progress? How will this benefit the district? Threatening lawsuits to stop progress? How will that help? Tying up district funds with ridiculous legal fees? Is that what our community really wants? Think about Dover. So why are these people stoking fear among seniors in our community? I have my theories, and none of them are pleasant, but I'll save those for another day. For me, it all comes down to trust. These fear-mongering res residents have given me zero reason to trust them, but Dr. Krauser, Dr. Lorfink, and the current and former school directors, can you please not comment on my comments? Dr. Krauser, Dr. Lorfink, and the current and former school directors who have voted to move forward with this project, they have given me many reasons to trust them. I believe that they have the best interest of our students and of the entire YS community in mind. They take their jobs very seriously. The school directors are not paid. They are taxpayers just like the rest of us. What would they possibly gain from steering the district in the wrong direction? I can think of several reasons why these fear mongers might be trying to instill fear and division in our community, but I cannot think of a single way that our district administration would benefit from lying to us. So yes, I trust them implicitly. I trust the district the same way I did 18 years ago when I first moved here. My property value is just as great now as when we first arrived in York, and I credit our school district for much of that. It is short-sighted to look at things any other way. Trust, it's that simple. Thank you. Well, she said it. <laughs> um, I'm Deborah Clayhower. I live in Farquhar Estates, and I am 70. I'm retired. I've never had children. I specifically moved to a district with an excellent school system because I think that it bodes well for all the property values, the people that live in those kind of communities, and I continue to support the public schools in bet or bettering themselves. I'm fully in support of this new proposal. I think all boats rise. Um, I am going to make a comment to Chris Sanders specifically because she inappropriately accessed my Farquhar Estates private email group. We've had leaflets. We've had door-to-door -door visitors. She inappropriately accessed a private email group she had no permission to use and blast emailed us with what I believe is disinformation. I am in front of these people telling you you do not have permission to use those email addresses. Excuse me. If you would just address your comments okay. to the board. Thank All right, you. Well, okay, in front of the board then. Thank you. Um, and I think that that group, if they have a view to present, they can present it. I'll, you know, that's good. Don't, don't use those kind of tactics because they really work against you. Um, so in summary, yes, I support it. I don't have kids that benefit from it. It bothers me that people who had kids in the school system and are all support of what's happening in the schools suddenly no longer support it when their kids aren't directly benefiting from it. So that's what I have to say. <laughs> Uh, one one question, please, for the record. I, we uh, understood your name, but I don't think you stated your township and or address. For states, Spring Garden Township. Spring Garden. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you for your comment. Yes, sir. Hi. Good evening, esteemed board members and fellow residents of uh, York Suburban School Again, District. excuse me, your name and your... Is yep. Sean Stabley, and I've been living in Spring Garden Township for 18 years. <clears throat> Only recently learning of your school construction and renovation projects, I sent you, the board members, an email on Monday, April 1st, to accurately understand all tax implications that these projects will impose on me financially. On Tuesday, April 2nd, I received an email response from Dr. Scott Krauser. Thank you, sir. Um, it was a quick response to, <clears throat> although you confirmed the tax calculator on the school website does in fact reflect the costs that I can expect to be responsible for, you indicated it does not include any annual operating costs that have yet to be determined. In response to your email, I have three questions that I deem essential to understand now in order to make financial decisions on whether it's feasible for me to remain living at my current address within this school district. Number one, when can I expect to learn the specifics of the additional annual operating costs and how will they be reflected in tax increases to me? And I take from your silence, you're not going to answer me here, which is fine. Well, we'll get back to you. That's normal procedure, sir. 
That's yep. fine. Thank you. Number two, uh, will you be publishing a tax calculator of the additional annual operating costs, and how will they be reflect? Uh, sorry, uh, annual costs, and when can I expect uh, that to be available to me? And three, even though this third question might seem rhetorical in nature, I assure you it is not, and I would appreciate a response from the school board. With only four months remaining until 2024 York Suburban tax bills will be sent out, why are you waiting so long to inform the taxpaying residents of the financial impact that these costs will have on us? Depending on how substantial those costs will translate to each taxpayer, there isn't enough time remaining to be able to make an educated decision on whether it is financially feasible and prudent to continue to maintain a residence in the York Suburban School District for myself. I very much appreciate the opportunity to address the board and thank you in advance for your reply to my questions. Thanks very much. Uh, somebody will be reaching out to you, Dr. Krauser. We'll take care of that. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, Shane Trout. Um, Ellen Friedrich. I live across the street from you. What That's been done, sir. It's been done, sir. We're waiting. Ellen, I assume you recognize me. If you have comments to address to the board, please do so. I, I'm okay. just making I just making live across the street from Ellen. I, I, I'm sorry, sir. Recognize me. Again, we need your name and your township. I'm Shane Trout. I live across the street from Ellen Spring and Sperry. Literally across the street. I thought she would recognize me, but apparently not. Um, anyway, I went to York Suburban High School. Um, have significant interest in the taxes that would be levied on me. And I find this significantly disrespectful to everybody that lives in the area. And I want this to stop. So I, I don't know. I didn't have anything more articulate to say, but. Thank you for your comment. Yeah, okay. Hi, I'm Bernadette Whitaker, uh, York Suburb, uh, Suburban School District, uh, Springs Ferry Township. I'll wait a second. Yes, please. And before you continue, if I could just ask, I'm sorry to do this, but ask you folks to please move from behind the board members. It's, there's, uh, yeah, I, I, I apologize for the inconvenience, but we do have confidential information and people are uncomfortable with the, excuse me, sir, would you mind to please? I appreciate that. Thank you so much, sir. I apologize for interrupting you, the interruption. That's <laughs> okay. Please. Um, my name is Bernadette Whitaker, Spring and Sperry Township, uh, York Suburban. Uh, I spoke last time, and most of you heard what I said last time, and I'm not going to repeat it. I just want to say, if you could... For my sake, and, and I know several other people, is there any way that we can get maybe a, a list of what's wrong with the school, uh, the East York School, and why we're, we're building a new school? That's my biggest uh, concern, is what exactly is wrong with the school? And if there's something really wrong right now, maybe our kids shouldn't be in there, you know, if it's, you know, mold or something, but, you know, what is actually wrong with the school, and it, it, is there any way that it's, 
you know, can be just renovated and we can save some of that money for future, like everyone else is saying, future projects with the high school, you know, with the other schools. We have a lot of schools in, in the York Suburban and York Suburban is a fantastic school district. My kids went here, like I told you all last time, they graduated from here. They did really well. Uh, I, I love the fact that we have school board teachers, you know, j janitors, everybody works together, but we need to work together now, I feel, and just, you know, give us a rundown of what's wrong with the school and why we can't just renovate it and save some money for future projects. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I might, I, I, I would refer you to um, the website. Much of the information you're uh, requesting is, is on the website. Um, Yeah, much much of it is there. So thank thank you. Is there another public comment this evening? Yes, I'm Chris Sanders. I live in um, Springsbury Township. And before I begin, I just wanted to say, you know, I used to think my way was the right way. It was my way or the highway. I had tunnel vision. And then after I got a little bit older, I thought, well, maybe. Maybe I should listen to some other people. And you know what happened? They said things to me that I never thought of. So um, it's really not too late for you people. I don't say you people. I mean, it's not too late to stand up and say, wait a minute. Let's mm -hmm. look at it again. We've got plenty of people here. All that That's all they're asking for. That's all they're asking for. So I'm here to give you the concerned York residents' latest update. They want you to know how they perceive your behavior towards our group. And some of this was in the public comments uh, that were printed um, on the website. Here's the first one, and these aren't just three people. I've heard these from numerous people. The first one is the boards, eye rolls, and smirks during public comments are shameful from anyone in a leadership position, let alone elected officials. The second, I spent a lot of time catching up on current and projected mill rates and wondering how the board could be so nonchalant with the projected tax increases beyond the capital campaign. The third, you might as well have been talking to the living dead. The solicitor was so bored with the whole situation, she needs to have her billable hours cut. And I will say to you that I do know how much was paid to her firm last year and this year, and I'll be talking about that at a later date. Now, here is further information, evidence, facts, um, again, of your behavior towards us. Two years ago this month at the board meeting held on April the 25th, 2022, and you can view this board meeting on YouTube for, your, for yourself in case you want to confirm what I am saying. This is what Lois Ann Schroeder, the current president of this board, had to say. I know to some of us, we are in total agreement, common ground. But I worry there are members of the community that are, I will just call it, uneducated. This was said at a board meeting by Mrs. Schroeder. Then she says a little while later, this gets better. I am bringing this up because I think a lot of our community is uninformed. There are some that think, oh, you school board people are just crying poor. Or maybe you are just using this as an excuse to randomly cut the budget to raise my taxes. Well, that is not the case. It is real and it is scary. And we desperately need some help from the state if we are going to continue to be a top drawer school district. You have one minute. 
Well, if two years ago you're telling us we are desperately needing help from the state and our financial crisis at York Suburban is real and it's scary, then why the hell do you want us to put up further financial jeopardy with spending $120 million that the taxpayers don't want you to spend? Let me finish by saying, yes. Let me finish by saying that at the end of the board meeting, you voted 7-2 to two to pass this budget, and of course to include a tax increase to us of 4%. There were two people that stood up for the hardworking families of this district, James Sanders and Joel Sears. The other seven, as usual, just decided, let's bilk the taxpayers one more time. Like Lois Ann said, they're just uneducated and uninformed. I see a little smirk on your face now, Mrs. Schroeder. I don't think it's funny. Well, you have woken up the sleeping giant, and we are not going to stop. That's time. Thanks for your comment. You are welcome. Michael Park, Harford Road, Springersbury Township. Welcome back, Madam President. Um, over the last couple of weeks, I have people have come up to me saying I've threatened school district, I've threatened school board members. People are telling me I'm trying to bankrupt the district. I don't know where this nonsense is coming from. All I'm trying to do is get your attention and get you involved with the people. There's another 50 people sitting out here that would like to have a town hall meeting. All right. I realize times are tough. Um, I had teachers over at uh, Yorkshire tell me they got by their own card stock. I have. Yeah, sorry. I had the athletic direct, direct or the athletic department getting their budget cut. I get it. If you spend $120 million, it's a lot of money. All right? And I realize, I guess it's a cost prohibitive for you to have a town hall meeting. So I don't know if you're familiar with, I have the largest indoor venue next to the Expo Center. I'm on the east side of the district, just off the east side of your district. I'm willing to provide my venue free of charge to the district for you, Dr. Krauser, to come speak to everybody. I'll have my staff man it, my AV crew. It won't cost the district a dime. I even provide refreshments. And is Steve Deal here? I don't know if he's... I'll talk to Steve Deal, and we'll get sheriff deputies there for protection. So that will give you an opportunity, free of charge, to come out and talk to everybody. That's what they've been asking for, and that's what they would like to do. And I'm willing to do that. So I hope you take me up on the offer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Karen Clifford, um, Spring Garden Township. Uh, I just sort of came to see what the fuss was about. And I do recall over the past several months, most of the school board members had advocated to come to meetings that were talking about the building project. And I don't know how well attended they were, but I believe that was something that you were trying to inform the district about. About 60 years ago, uh, my parents came down from Connecticut uh, when they came down, AMS came into town, now Harley Davidson, and they asked what was the best school district to build in. And without question, it was York Suburban. My daughter recently got graduated in uh, 1918, uh, 1918, God, uh, 2018, and I felt it was important that she had the same quality education that I had. I do realize it's not easy to be a board member and sit and talk about taxes. I taught for almost 40 years in a district that literally was at the bottom of the districts in the county, tax base-wise and education-wise. They put through a building project that literally had seven buildings built in 15 years. Was that cheap? No, it wasn't. But during that time period, they were able to raise not only the quality of education, but make the buildings energy efficient. Also, when you have buildings set apart between East York and Indian Rock, you have to have staff, special staff, travel between the buildings. That takes up time and money, not a lot of money for transportation, but time for a person to travel. Having a building built that all grades are accommodated in one building makes it much easier for those problems to disappear, but also have staff connected 
and students learning at a much higher rate. No, do I want tax savings? Absolutely not. However, I believe it's been it's the responsibility of board members to check out what is the most economic versus repairs. Repairs are not like house repairs. School repairs take a toll on each building. Both buildings are, I wouldn't say ancient, but they're older. They require significant repairs. Why kick the can down the road when you know in five years or so more people will be here saying, hey, we need another building. And in that case, it will be triple the amount that is being proposed today. So in short, I do support the building project. Thank you. Thank you. Is there another comment? Hi, good evening. I'm Brenda Enders, and I live on Sundale Drive, and the elementary school is in my backyard. My concern is I was away on vacation, and I come home, and there's different holes in the back of the school where they, there's water in them. They're all um, roped off, and I was wondering what's going on because the, I had talked to you about um, the springs all in the backyard, I guess it's about 20 years ago, I put a back porch on my house, and when they were laying the block for the side, it, water kept coming and coming. They couldn't do that for a long time until they, they got the water because there's springs in the whole back thing. But I walked back there and looked at it, and actually I was barefooted, and everything was soaking wet. Now, my yard wasn't, but all that was soaking wet and stuff. And I'm just wondering, down the road, what's that going to cost? Are they gonna, is the school going to sink? or I don't know. I don't know that kind of thing, but I'm concerned about it. So, and I, my son, he graduated from York Suburban, and um, it is a school district and stuff. But my mom always told us, like, why are you breaking something when it can be fixed? And it's a lot of money. And a lot of people I know in, in the whole Spring of Spirit Township, they're concerned. They're older, and all the income they have is their Social Security, and they're going to lose their homes. And I'm, I'm just concerned, why can't they fix the school, or why can't they do something? And the school, I mean, it's beautiful and stuff, but that's a lot of money. And we're, we're talking about education, not beauty. So that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you very much. Hi, good evening. Hello. Um, I am Ellie Thomas. Um, I live in Spring Garden Township. Um, and... Um, me and my mom did some research, and our source is the Dissertation on Elementary School Consolidation and Restructure. It was published in the year um, 2010, and um, it's about the distillation cited pros and cons of elementary school consolidation from four districts in the USA. Without community buy-in, the Community culture is lost, causing a separation between the schools that are being consolidated, pitying them against each other. Um, that's all I had to say. Thank you. Is there further comment? Is there further comment this evening? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Angela Steva. I live in uh, Spring Garden Township. Um, at the very least, I'd like to ask today that obviously this room is not large enough to hear everybody that would like to uh, voice their opinions or be able to listen to it, that uh, we could possibly have a town hall um, meeting. I do think that some of us are com might be coming to this a little bit late to the game. Um, I really learned about this just a couple of weeks ago. Um, I moved into, obviously I'm not from York Suburban, <laughs> as you could tell by my accent. Uh, we moved into this district eight years ago um, we chose it purely based on the school district. Uh, when we were buying a house and looking for a place to live with our children, we wanted the best school district. And at that time, this was one of them. And um, now that my children have flown the nest and we will be looking to downsize in a few years, uh, this 
buildings and the taxes and the lack of the way that the school district um, scores have gone down um, pro proposes a threat to us as uh, potential sellers um, and the market. And that concerns me and I think it concerns a lot of people in the district. And I think that's important whether, you know, I, I support the children having a better uh, academic lifestyle, but I don't think that buildings do that. And um, I think the town hall meeting is, is appropriate. You can see there's a lot of people here today. They can't all fit in this room. So let's give them a room where they can fit in and everyone's voice is heard. Anyone else? Yes. I don't have anything prepared, so I'm just kind of speaking out ad lib. My name is Penelope Wood. I live in Elmwood. I've been there 22 years. My children did not attend York Suburban, nor did my grandchildren. My son was already through school when I moved here. I love this community. I'm retired. I've been retired for a year, and I choose to stay here. But the, the, seeing all this going on is just very upsetting. You know, I'm, I'm not crazy about paying extra taxes. We are being taxed to death in this country. We have elderly people. I'm elderly. I'm 72 years old. We have elderly people here that cannot afford their house. That's what they're saying. I can afford it. But I'm here speaking for me because I don't want to put out extra money if I don't have to, but also for them. It's heartbreaking to hear some of them. They're on fixed income. And every, everything keeps going up, inflation, gas, you name it. And now you pile this on top of it. Of course they're concerned and they're worried about it. And I would ask you to consider what the gentleman before me offered was the, a meeting where you could talk to the people that are just now coming on board. I know you're disappointed. You probably put a lot of work into this. And here you have people challenging it now after you spent so much time on it. But we need to understand, what, is, what are we in for here? And just like the other gentleman, he needs to know because he may have to move. People need to plan these things ahead of time. So we would like to understand exactly what you're proposing. Is there some other compromise that possibly could be done? And if there's not, what is it going to cost us? Because I'm, you know, everybody's sitting here with this bill hanging over their head, and all the other unknowns that we're experiencing right now in this country, would like to put a stop to it by you talking to us and coming to us with the with figures that we can look at and see, rather than having to go to a web page. I went to the web page and tried to read it, and it's very lengthy. And by the time I got finished reading it, I'd forgotten half of what I had read. And I'm a very smart person. I've had a very high-powered, stressful job for 30 years here in this community, and that's why I'm here. And it, so, so I'm not dumb. And there's a lot of people that just needs to come up to speed on this thing. I remember when they wanted to put the police, rebuild the police station up here, I went to that meeting. I was totally against it, totally against it. But that man that did the presentation explained why it was needed and what it was going to cost. And by the time I left that meeting, I was for it. And you may find people in this group that will be for it that aren't for it right now. But once they hear this, you, you may have some people that are on your side and wanting to at least compromise. So I, I would very much suggest that you do that so that maybe we can put some understanding, you know, people can understand what's going on, and you won't have some so much of this back and forth. And by the way, I am not a fear monger. I'm a taxpayer. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Oh, one other thing before I go. I do need the gentleman before me that may have to sell his house. You know, he needs to know some figures. I would like to have some figures too myself. If this town hall thing doesn't come by, doesn't happen, I would like to have some figures. I plan ahead. And I need to know if I need to plan ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm Catherine Lutz, uh, Spring, um, Spring Garden. Um, I'm Ellie's mom. You guys probably recognize me at this point. Um, so I just wanted to um, take a minute to say that um, 
I do have a copy of the dissertation that um, Ellie spoke about, and I'm I'm going to email it out to all the school board meetings, so you guys, all the school board members, so you guys can take a look at it as well. Um, it's about 160 pages, um, and a lot of it is just really exciting educational stuff. I'm sure that you guys are used to. <laughs> um, but I did um, send it over to Dr. Krauser as well. I know we've had some holidays in there, so. Um, but certainly, I think that's. Um, good information to have. It does talk about multiple different school districts, the pros and cons. Um, the two biggest re ways for, to ensure success in this is one, strong leadership, and two, community buy-in. One of those things we have, the other one is split. So um, I think that that's one thing that would be beneficial for you guys to read too. Um, so I'll, I'll email that out and um, Obviously, there's some other things that probably these, the cost um, of these renovations would not include. Um, for instance, there's a water fountain at the middle school that the kids take bets on what mineral it's going to taste like that day. So little things like that probably should be um, investigated and also looked at and figured into the budget. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. My name is Sarah Reinecker, Spring Garden Township. Tonight I stand before you as an individual citizen with 20 plus years of history of volunteering in the York Suburban School District. My goal was then and continues to be assisting our school community so that children are provided a fair and equitable education within the top performing school district in district in York County. Let me point out to some of the comments that were made, we are still the top performing school district in York County. Salient to the ongoing dialogue at these meetings about the district's reconstruction plans and the YS Concerned Citizens Group voicing opposition related to the tax increase it will require to fund it, I offer this. On Tuesday, April 2nd, I attended a meeting hosted by the YS Concerned Citizens Group. This was the second of two meetings they have hosted at Weishaven, the first on February 27th. As a side note, Weishaven Banquet Center is owned by Mike Park, which he informed you of this evening. Weishaven is located in Red Lion School District. Therefore, school taxes for Weishaven are collected by Red Lion schools. The YS Concerned Citizens Group leaders are Joel Sears, Mike Park, James Sanders, Chris Sanders, Aaron Hill, and Melanie Morgan. During their Q&A, I asked a question directed to Mr. Sears as he was the main presenter. The question was, under the banner of your group's quest for transparency and seeking the truth, I'm concerned about the wording your group mailed by y U.S. Postal Service to what I believe was every resident in the district because I received one. Their postcard read, quote, tax creases for new building projects and upgrades could result in an incremental property tax payment for you and your family. If passed, the current school board's proposal would result in a tax increase of $1,500 every year for 10 years, totaling over $15,000 total per household, end quote. My question was not one of debating numbers. My question was one of integrity. I wanted to know if the leadership of YS Concerned Citizens felt it was fair and honest to structure their words on the postcard as if $1,500 a year would be the tax increase for every resident household in the district. I also pointed out that my postcard arrived three days prior to their first town hall hosted at Weishaven on February 27th. I pointed out that the timing seemed curious as if the wording was intentionally presented this way to create shock value or use scare tactics so residents would be concerned that $1,500 could actually be their tax increase and therefore be motivated to attend their meeting. 
By way of observation, I attended the February 27th meeting as well. And that had approximately 350 people in attendance directly after the set, the send of their postcard. On April 2nd, there was approximately 60 attendees. Mr. Sears responded that the numbers shared on their postcard was pointing to the average. Let me point out that nowhere on their postcard is the word average used. Also, for a $1,500 per year tax increase to be accurate, a resident would have to own a house assessed at a little over $2.5 million. You have one minute. The average assessment Mr. Sears and his group are using on their flyers, but not their postcard, is $237,000, not $2.5 million. Finally, I didn't hear the remainder of Mr. Sears' answer. It was disrupted by James Sanders. Acting as an individual citizen, which I respect he have, has every right to do, yelling out from the back of the room over the dialogue between Mr. Sears and myself. I'd like to point out I had no intention of asking a question that evening, but when I heard once again how this group structures their information to egregiously mislead the citizens of this district, I made the decision that people in the room deserve to hear that my point of view, which, by the way, their group continues to claim they welcome. And yet, when it was offered, is it attempted to shut, I was attempted to shut that, be shut down by rude behavior, which is especially disappointing coming from a sitting school board member of the York Suburban School District. I will stop here. My last comments were of great and thought, uh, thanking you for your great and thoughtful committed service to this district. I fully trust we are in good hands and you have my support. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Good evening. Good evening. My, my name is Mary Bellavo in Springersbury Township. And um, the last, be I was at that meeting where, where the, the last speaker uh, talked about, and um, I didn't see anybody being rude at that meeting. And they did mention the word average as far as the, the, uh, the amount that they were mentioning an average amount of, of taxes being raised. So I just, I, on that particular postcard. But personally, when, when I was asked to join this group, I, before I even had any information about the, the actual cost of, of this project, of this building project, I, I noticed the last two years my taxes really went up a lot. And I wondered why. And I didn't know why until I found out recently. And this board was elected by the taxpayers of this community and are, should be accountable to the taxpayers. People only recently, myself included, are finding out about this multi-million dollar building project. And, and as far as I can see, the children are being educated very well in the buildings they're in right now. And if they do need an upgrade, I do agree with the a person that spoke previously that we should take a look at the buildings and if the plumbing needs to fix, fix it. But uh, that, that's a lot different than having this multi-million dollar project uh, that's coming. We know that also that $120 million estimate in this economy is going to triple probably by the time the shovel goes to ground. It's going to triple. And I don't think everybody, everything is even estimated in the $120 million that you've done now. And we know the cost of plumbing and everything in the last two years has, has increased. So I, I would like to have also um, a cost of not what they're saying uh, that they, somebody said they voted a long time ago what it would cost to fix the buildings. I'm not talking about upgrading and making grand buildings out of them, that kind of a fix. I'm just talking about what it would cost to just fix the plumbing. You can put new doors in later. Children can be educated as a former educator myself. They can, be, uh, they can be educated very well, and they are being educated very well in York Suburban with the buildings that are presently now, present, they have presently. Um, and also, I would just say that I would be in total favor of a, of a town hall meeting because I myself have talked to people. People are very confused out there. There's a lot of misinformation all over the place. And, and I think the board should be happy to answer questions from taxpayers so the truth can come out. 
We need truth. We do need truth and transparency. And I just want to mention one thing, too. The people I have been talking to, and I feel really badly. A woman sat uh, behind me at one of the board meetings and said that they, uh, at the, the meeting you gave the presentation to that they were going to lose their home. They would, ha- they, would have, they would not be able to have extra taxes. And my next-door neighbor, they're from Uc- Ukraine, and the husband does not speak English, and, and, the, and the wife speaks a little bit of English, she came over and begged me to please advocate they can't afford any more taxes. They keep their lights off during the night. They don't put lights on at night They're hard to save electricity. They have a garden in their backyard for extra food. And these are my next-door neighbors that moved in several years ago next to me. And there are many other people that I've talked to that are going to lose their homes. So I think that I just asked the school board to have a heart to see, I know you, there can't, you can't tell me to fix, um, the, I'm not talking about the fix, you, somebody, it always seems to be confusion. When you go back and say you have one fix, minute. Okay. I would just say that I would advocate um, strongly for a town hall meeting. So but there's, uh, because so the misinformation, that the truth can come out and that the people can have these questions answered because, um, there's just major confusion, and, and people are going to be losing their homes. So I thank you for uh, considering this and to, listen, and, and to be able to listen to what the taxpayers are saying. We can't, this is not sustainable. That's the, this is not going to be sustainable to the people in the community tax-wise. It cannot be. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Is there a further comment this evening? Okay. Thank you very much. I think I failed to uh, ask earlier a a reminder to please silence your cell phone during our meeting. Um, Our next item on the agenda is discussion and action on our board minutes. I'm seeking approval of the minutes uh, of the regular monthly meeting conducted March 18th, 2024. So moved. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Are there any votes to the contrary? Otherwise, they can be, this can be considered a unanimous roll call vote. Uh, as far as the board president's report goes, um, thank you very much for your um, attendance with us this evening. Um, the board met in executive session earlier today, uh, April 8, 2024, at 5 p.m., as permitted by Section 707 of the Sunshine Act for the receipt of legal information, no official action was taken. Um, I wanted to um, also in my report remind board members, please let this serve as your reminder to complete the required statement of financial interest form. As you know, we're required by law as public officials to complete this form by May 1. Whether you choose to file electronically or you complete the traditional paper form, a copy must be submitted to Mrs. Potts for filing here in our district office. These forms remain on file here in the superintendent's office. For those who serve on committees of various organizations we support, you're also expected to file a hard copy with them as well. I want to take a minute to congratulate all the students uh, who've Uh, received accolades recently. Um, We've had great success with various co-curricular and extracurricular activities. Our spring musical received rave reviews last month. Lots of students and staff members were involved in that production. And we thank and congratulate all of them, all of those who contributed their time and talents toward its success. We had great success with our winter sports program. I think All of the winter sports uh, advanced into postseason play. Uh, That's certainly something to uh, be proud of. Each team had a great season, and many of them advanced to uh, postseason, some all the way to state championships. And we thank them for representing our York Suburban community in such outstanding ways. I also want to acknowledge, recognize, some good news with our musicians recently. Alex Bian and Rebecca West uh, recently had great success with the Allstate Orchestra. 
uh, honors and will be participating in all state concerts later this spring. They're going to join Finn Sullivan, near and dear to our heart, is the child of, of one of our board members um, who had great success uh, in jazz band and will also be performing in a, a all state concert. Uh, I've said many times, uh, it's the kids are why we do what we do. And singing their praises and touting their successes uh, is is very important to me. And uh, once again, we congratulate and celebrate uh, all of those accomplishments. Moving on, Ms. Scalette, our student representative is here. I hope I didn't steal your thunder, kiddo. I, uh, I, I, you, we can we can say it all again if I did. Okay, so I'm um, just going to start by mentioning that there are a lot of sports going on right now. There's baseball, softball, boys tennis, girls and boys lacrosse, track and field, and vo boys volleyball. And the um, track and field just had the Herb Schmidt Relays on Friday where a bunch of other schools bring track and field members and they all compete. And that was a great time. I got to volunteer. There were lots of Minithon members who volunteered. So everyone was really involved in different ways, and that went really well. On a note going into the future, prom tickets are on sale until this Friday. So if there are any kids listening, you have until Friday to buy your prom ticket. I, I'm sure they have nothing better than to do than to watch our board meeting. Friday of this week is also Minithon. So Minithon is when we stay at the school in order to raise awareness and raise money for childhood cancer. Um, then some preparation for next year is starting to happen. So there have been elections for officers for the National Honor Society, Student Council, and the National English Honor Society so far. I know um, Math Honor Society uh, elections are coming up shortly. So those are just preps starting to set up next year and get involved. Then there was spring break a little over a week ago now. And right before spring break happened, the National Honor Society hosted an egg hunt for kindergarten, and that was at both Valley View and Yorkshire, and I know that went really well. We hit all the eggs. One of the days it was rained out, so they all went in the cafeteria, and it worked, it worked well. And then this Thursday is the Tri-M. That's the name of the Music Honor Society at the school. They are having their senior music recital at 7 o'clock in the high school auditorium. And that event is free, and they will have light refreshments. It's a great time to see all the seniors perform one last time before they leave the school. I'm sorry, that's this Thursday. That's this Thursday at 7, yes. Thank you. That is everything. I'm sorry, maybe we can maybe we can answer that as sort of out of order, but maybe we can clarify. Do we know anything about a music concert? I would say check the website on, on we that. Do have, we, have a, we do have a calendar of events tagged to the yeah. end of the calendar agenda. Calendar events are tagged on the, uh, agenda. On the website. I yep. don't have that in front of me right now. What? Oh, my mic's not on. on. Oh, I have a loud voice, so sorry. Thank you. Um, Okay, moving on. Dr. Krauser, superintendent's report. Thank you, Madam President. Um, a few items this evening, kind of in the notion of celebrating students, and, and Ms. Scalette kind of stole a little bit of thunder there. We do have a lot to celebrate. Uh, I will say one other item. It was uh, an exceptional afternoon from the scientific community. Um, we had all of our students out um, and engage in uh, – from beginning to end, there was a lot of us out kind of witnessed it. Aside from some clouds here and there, we were able to get some great opportunities to engage in the eclipse this afternoon. Um, all the students in all the buildings did an exceptional job with that. So kudos to the science department, the teachers, the students, and the community at large. Uh, a great opportunity um, to take advantage of. So again, celebrating a little bit of success, we've got two big items that I want to talk about tonight. And we've got Mr. Corsi to kind of walk us through that winter season. As we've said, uh, that winter season was quite exceptional. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Corsi to do a little recap of our winter programs. And Dr. Adams, too, I see sliding in there behind. I stole some of your thunder, so I apologize in advance. We did. We, we, got did. Us, okay. we can celebrate them twice, though. It's all good. We can celebrate them three or four times because this is an exciting time for York Suburban Athletics. So you understand what's going around in a minute. It's just a little keepsake I'll explain. First and foremost, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am honored and very excited to do this presentation to recap our winter sports season. We are doing this a little later than we traditionally do. You'll notice typically this is taking place in March. But however, because of the overwhelming success 
that our athletic department had, we still had several teams competing when it was time for the March board meeting. So we found it prudent to be able to basically wait so that we can celebrate all of our student athletes, all of our scholars in an appropriate manner and so that we can recognize all of their accomplishments and not come to you in March and then come back in April and say, oh, by the way, we forgot fill in the blank. So what we put together this evening is just a brief overlook of the tremendous winter sports season. I would venture out and say I'd make a large wager that this winter sports season, after talking to some of the York Suburban historians, is by far one of the most successful seasons we've had in the history of the school district. Now, you know, we don't know how credible those historians are, but we're going to take them at their word, all right? So the first thing we're going to pull up is we had three winter sports teams that celebrated division championships within the YAIA, the York Adams League. Those teams, as you can see, girls basketball, boys basketball, and girls swimming. These three teams will be a recurring theme in this presentation because they all had phenomenal runs throughout the season. And in addition to teams, we had a, a plethora of student athletes that had a, a, a litany of individual accomplishments as well. Next clip. As you'll see right here, I won't read all the names, but as you can see, we had several YA All-Star team members from all of our teams across the board. This was a, a, a thrilling time to be an athletic director because it seemed like every day for about a week straight I was getting an email saying, here are your All-Stars for boys basketball, here are your All-Stars for girls basketball, here are your All-Stars for swimming, wrestling. It was just a really, real cool time to be a part of our community because we had so many young men and young women who just excelled at their craft athletically. Next. These two gentlemen got a lot of fanfare this year. Um, the gentleman standing to my left here has been smiling for about four months nonstop. Um, we had two young men who were named the YA Player of the Year in their division or in their section or in the league as a whole. Um, the first, obviously, being Mr. Tyler Adams, who, as you'll see as we move forward, had a record-breaking year in terms of wrestling as an individual wrestler. And then the second young man is actually a freshman, Mr. Nasir Barnes, who was named Player of the Year. Uh, I don't have the facts, but I can tell you, and someone who's been doing this for over a decade, it is very rare that a freshman athlete not only starts on varsity, but also is named Player of the Year in that particular league. So he had a phenomenal year as well. Next slide. This is one of my favorite coaches. I love all my coaches equally, but it's like children. You love them all, but you sometimes love them differently. And this young lady is constantly in my office every other day trying to figure out how we can improve, how we can take our program to the next level. Um, I said to her, you won a championship. What more do you want? She wants two championships. So we want to recognize Ms. Jess Weaver, who was named the YA Coach of the Year for girls basketball. And as we'll see shortly, her team had, again, some, some very noteworthy accomplishments. Next slide. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Trojan Territory. This year, as part of one of our initiatives for the athletic department, we have targeted getting our student body more involved with the athletic process. Obviously, we know – Traditionally, our student athletes, along with our members of band and members of SGA, are traditionally leaders within the school. And so we want to make sure that there's a connect between investment between our student athletes and our teams and our student body at large. And I think we've done an amazing job of that so far, and it's evidenced by these pictures. The first gentleman right up here, who somebody sitting on this panel may know, by the name of Finn, came to two of our games and played the national anthem before our playoff games. He did it once. He was shocked that I asked him. And I said, you made all state in your craft. We want to recognize and celebrate you at the game. And we want you to demonstrate your talent, your God-given ability in front of a packed gym. He was honored. He did it. And as soon as he got done playing, he came over. He said, Mr. Corsi, that was awesome. Can I do it again? <laughs> I said, you sure can. So we brought him in for a second time. So that's the first picture of the gentleman in the middle. The pictures on the outside you see are our student section. If you attended a home basketball game this year, you know if you didn't get there early, you weren't getting a seat. And the reason for that is twofold. I can't take all the, all the credit. A, obviously if our teams didn't have the success that they had this year, it's hard to motivate students, or even adults for that matter, to come watch a team that's 1-21. in 21. But – we fortunately had successful teams. So first part is just the overwhelming success that our teams had. But then also I want to give a huge shout-out to Austin Stern, 
who was the leader of our student section. He's also involved with student government. He's involved with Minithon. And it's not just him. It's, it's, there's, there's a plethora of young men and young women that work along with him. But he has kind of been my point of contact. And I'm actually very nervous that he's graduating and leaving us because I don't know who's going to pick up the baton, but we need somebody definitely uh, using a track reference to pick up the stick because he did an amazing job. These pictures you see are all of these crowds that we had at these games. So much so that when we played Dallas Town in girls basketball, we went on a run and Dallas Town just folded. It was so loud. You, they were looking into the crowd, people swaying, waving their hands. It was an awesome environment. And their coach came up to me afterwards and said, I want you guys to get in a neutral site because your crowd affected this game. And so for me, that kind of made me smile ear to ear. We were going to beat them anyway without the crowd, but that's neither here nor there. So I want to give a huge shout out to our student body. And obviously our students have kind of bought into what we're doing. And some of the things that we've been enacting, such as pep rallies and some incentives for kids to come to the game, have really, really, you know, worked. The kids have taken ownership and they've bought into being a part of the, the community at large. Next slide. The flyer or uh, program I just passed around to you guys is our official program booklet from Hoops for Harmony. Um, obviously, you can review it at your leisure. For those of you, there were some of you who attended. This was a major, major event that we had in January, and it served two purposes. First and foremost, we wanted to recognize and highlight harmony, unity. We wanted to, as Dr. King says, recognize people by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. And unfortunately, we have people in our country that – try to prey on our differences, when in actuality, there are more things that unite us than separate us. And there are certain people that don't want us to realize that. So the premise of this event is we bring teams in from all over the, the region, urban, rural, suburban, and we put them together and they play games. And then afterwards, they eat together, they eat a meal together, they discuss together, they have some think tanks together, and they're able to just interact and dialogue. And when the kids leave, They've shared each other's TikToks and IGs, and a kid from Berlin Valley, Pennsylvania, which is in the middle of nowhere, ends up being Instagram friends with a kid from Baltimore, Maryland, and they end up conversing. And for me, that was a beautiful, beautiful part of this event. In addition to that, we got over 1,000 signed petitions on our anti-racism pledge, and the pledge essentially just said, I denounce racism, I denounce hate, I love people based on who they are, not what they look like. So that was a huge, huge step for us. And then the second byproduct of that, which I'd be lying if I said didn't make me smile, was that we made a little bit of money for our booster club, which allows us to be able to award more scholarships to our graduating seniors to take care of those needs that people really don't think about, senior posters, senior flowers, senior gifts, recognition. So this event is something that was an overwhelming success, and stay tuned because I actually just had a meeting today with um, a couple people who are stakeholders in the community that want to take it to a whole other level. So just wanted to recognize that, and you can review that program at your leisure. It will show you just kind of the diversity of the teams that we had participating. Thanks. So obviously the big, big, big championship for our teams was our girls' basketball team won the District 3 championship, the PIAA District 3. Amazing game, went to overtime. I think I had three heart attacks during it, and I know Jess Weaver had four, <laughs> uh, especially when one of her leading scorers fouled out with about two minutes left in the game, and I had to take a walk and take a deep breath because I thought it was over. So our kids rallied. They played amazing, and again, it wasn't just a basketball thing. It wasn't just an athletic thing. We had that student section in the Giant Center packed all the way to the rafters in terms of our section. And so for me, it was a proud moment, not just because we won, because it really embodied what we were trying to, to accomplish here in terms of, you know, complementing the, the entire student and getting athletes, non-athletes together in, a, um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an environment that is conducive for both of them. So congrats to the girls. Next slide. We had several PIAA District 3 medalists. Now, you're going to see a lot of repeat young ladies on this list because our girls' swimming team killed it this year. They literally won event after event after event. And I'll show you the individual medalists, but I have to comment on this. They won gold medal after gold medal after gold medal. But just because of our school size, they don't have the depth that some of these other, other teams have. So we might have had the first place and second place swimmer, but those teams that got the fourth, fifth, and sixth place, they got points. And then if they won a couple of races by attrition, it ended up costing us. And the girls were so heartbroken, I cracked a joke. Um, Chloe, to this day, won't let me forget it. I said, Chloe, do you have enough gold medals? She had like three. She said, well, obviously I don't have enough. I should have one more. And she put her head down and walked away, and I said, ooh, too soon. <laughs> so amazing year for these young ladies, and you'll see right now as we pull them up. 
So Brent, obviously, District 3 champion in diving. There's that handsome young man again, Tyler Adams, District 3 champion for wrestling. His brother, Justin Adams, District 3, fifth place. Thank you, thank you, thank you, members, distinguished members of the school board for allowing girls wrestling because you'll see we had three young ladies that medaled this year. So, Lithiana, second place. Next. Angela, third place. Sarah Kohler, District 3 champ, 200 IM. This team, I'm, I'm going to read their names once and then we're going to skip by because you're going to see this picture like four times. So, obviously, Chloe, Sarah, Bryn, and Pisa, District 3 champs, 200 free relay. Peter, District 3 champ, 100 free. Chloe, District 3 champ, 50 free. The Fab Four, or Fantastic Four, 400 free champs. Chloe, second place. Chloe again, third place. And then the Fab Four once again. District 3, sixth place, 200 medley. And then our lone male swimmer that medaled, and I, I have to see him. I have to find him because he was like a lone wolf that whole weekend. Mikey, District 3, seven place in the 100 fly. These three ladies all medaled. Sarah, Peter, Chloe, District 3, 50 freestyle. All right, so we cleaned house in the district. And then you're one of maybe a handful of athletes across the state that are still competing. And there are people that go to the state championships, and they're just happy to be there because it's, great, it's a great accomplishment to get to that level. But not the Trojans. We went up there and we're like, we're coming home with hardware. So you'll see. Next slide. Mr. Tyler Adams finished second place. He is the second best wrestler in his weight class in the entire state of Pennsylvania. And in talking with Dr. Adams, I am not sure that we have ever had an individual athlete that has meddled at that high a level at the PIAA level. Please, general public, don't hold me to that. If you have a record of someone, email me, and we will give them a huge shout-out. But to my knowledge, this young man is in a class all of his own. Next slide. So we had two young ladies, again, thank you, thank you, thank you for girls wrestling, that got PIAA state medals. The first is Alyssiana. The second is Angela. And then the Fab Four or Fantastic Fours you rely, we, we relied to them on, they went up and basically went to Bucknell and cleaned up. So we had Chloe finished 11th, Peter finished 15th, and then the Fab Four, 200 free relay, third place. Peter again with a seventh place and 100 free. Chloe 16th place and the 500 free. And then the Fantastic Four, finishing third place in the 400 free relay. And then Bren finished 12th overall on diving. So I was putting this presentation together, and, and huge thanks to both Dr. Krauser and Dr. Adams and Dr. Laura Fink, who gave me some feedback on, you know, I was trying to encapsulate all the successes we had and the more that they gave me feedback, the more I was like, this is going to be a really long presentation. <laughs> but that's a really, really cool problem to have because I'm not sitting up here talking about something that is either putting people behind me asleep or people throwing tomatoes at me. This is something that we are celebrating the joys and the accomplishments of our student athletes. So on behalf of the York Suburban Athletic Department, I want to thank you board members, administration, for your support. I want to thank the community members for the support. And just know this is just the beginning. We're going to continue to um, ascend and take it higher and higher. So at this point, I'll take any questions. Any questions for Dr. Mr. Uh, Corsi? Dr. One Day. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Just a quick question. So yes, just so the public can get an understanding, like, what a big accomplishment this is. How many people were they going against in, like, the state level? Yes. So each event is different, and it, it's hard to have, you know, say, oh, it was 10 people, it was 12 people. But a general idea for a typical swimming event, 
you're only competing against maybe the top 30 to 40 people in your particular event. Um, Bucknell has specific times that you have to qualify on in order to meet those particular races. And so, again, every race is different because you have scratches, and every race time is different. You know, if you have three schools that tie with the same entry time, they may be an additional addition into the race. But just for conceptualization for those that may not be familiar, you are literally, when you compete in the state event, you are literally in the top 15% of the state in terms of athletes. And so to not only make it there and compete, but to bring home hardware the way that we did, we have some pretty amazing student athletes. Just let them know we're proud. And coaches. And coaches. <laughs> I'm going to pay for that one. <laughs> no, Coach Jenkins did an amazing job. Coach Weaver did a great job. Coach Kemp, Coach Gensel. Um, we 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 had we have some great great coaches, as evidenced by the product that they put on the court slash pool slash mat. <laughs> and when you think of all the um, the time and energy that goes into the you know the preparing to 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 be a student athlete and the the village it takes to to get them there, it's as as I said, that's that's why we do what we do. And I know that's I know that's that's true of you as well. Um, I have a question to go back to the um, the hoops for harmony event um, using the the new field house at the School of Technology was was a positive I- experience. I mean, as you probably know, it's that that school is near and dear to my heart as the York Suburban representative uh, over there. And again, that's the public money that you know built that facility. And uh, I just wanted to ask a little bit of feedback on that and how that went and that kind of thing. So that facility is beautiful. Um, it it was such that when teams walked in it that were not from York County, and I'm not even talking about the teams from Utah and Atlanta and D.C., I'm talking about teams from Harrisburg and Lancaster that are not familiar with that facility. They walked in and they kind of looked around in awe because it's a beautiful facility. And I think that it served our purpose because it had two gyms, so we could have two games going on simultaneously. And I think the seating capacity was perfect in the sense that every day we had between 3,000 and 5,000 people rotating through those stands. Now, full transparency, that wasn't all at one time. At no point did we have 5,000 people jam-packed into that field house. But based on our you know, gate receipts, it was a steady crowd throughout the day. It helps also when you have attractive matchups. So I, I'm, I'm very thankful to York County School of Technology for allowing us to use the facility. Um, it is my hope that we can work with them in the future um, to grow the event there at that site. Uh, I will say that um, there were some challenges in terms of just their school day ending and us starting our event at the time we did. But obviously there's nothing we can really do about that. They dismiss when they dismiss. Um, so there was some challenges in terms of, you know, to set up an event of this magnitude, we, you can't show up at 3 o'clock and play a game at 4. Like, that just doesn't work. Um, so those are some things we can navigate. And, and, again, oftentimes you don't know what you don't know. So going through it the first time, this is not the first time I've hosted this event, but it's the first time I've hosted it here in York County and specifically at that venue. So I took some notes and we did some debrief with both York County School of Technology Facilities Department, as well as some of our booster leadership on just how we can improve it, how we can do better. But overall, that that, that facility is is an amazing, amazing attribute, and it enhanced the class, if you will, of the event because we weren't playing in, you know, a little matchbox. We were playing in almost what the kids deemed as an arena. (laughs) Right, right. No. That's great. Thank you. I just – I was curious about that, so thank you. I will let you know, Lois, and having been there – the first question out of the mouths of many of our York Suburban kids is, is this what we're going to get with the new high school? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't no. think so, kids, but stick yes. around. Come to, <laughs> come to the Harmony Hoops every year. Am I right? <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Anything I don't think else? so either, but I'm not opposed if you want to talk about it. <laughs> thank you very much for, for joining All for us. your time. Thank you, Mr. Corsi. And again, thank you to the – absolutely lots to celebrate. And that is, uh, again, kind of just echoing that, that's students, that's parents and all involved coaches and administrators and teachers who are all a big part of that. So the next item I have uh, this evening is we are celebrating Autism Awareness Month, and we've got a team um, from the district to give us some information and share a little bit about the students and Autism Awareness Month for the month. Other than me. All right. So, hi, I'm Missy Skimsky. Um, I'm one of the autistic support teachers over at Valley View Elementary. 
Um, April is Autism Awareness Month. Um, so we thought we'd come and just talk to you a little bit about what our program is, um, the successes we've had in the last seven years as a district-run program, um, and then show you some really adorable pictures of our kiddos. Um, so first, just a really quick recap, um, just what autism is. Really, really quick kind of summary. Developmental disorder, um, definitely present from birth or very early on. Um, you kind of see what people think of as later onset, just because it's a later diagnosis, it doesn't mean it always wasn't there. Um, in, impacts communication, behavior, um, and social functioning. So it can impact all of those areas, or one, two, or any combination. Um, definitely a spectrum. And we service that spectrum in York Suburban. Um, we have students that access general education without any supports, all the way down to our most high need students that we service in our program. Um, Prevalence of autism. So some of you may not know this program was brought back to district, I believe, in 2017. So it's still relatively new for York Suburban. Um, when we brought this back, it was about 1 in 54 children diagnosed with autism. Right now, the number is looking at 1 in 36. So, and I think that's probably off a little bit because of COVID. Um, I think we're a little behind on those numbers. So definitely growing. I'm not sure it's growing so much as we're getting better at identifying it and better at treating it, um, intervening early. So this makes this extra important. Because the prevalence is so much greater in our school buildings, in our communities, since we've brought back this program in 2017, this is just some of the professional development and some of the education we've been able to provide the district. Um, and our colleagues, we've provided trainings for paraprofessionals, not just within the autistic support program, but also within our buildings. Um, we've been able to provide trainings for administrators. New teacher induction, believe it or not, I've been there a few times. Um, it's great to get the, the fresh faces out of college. Um, we've even done bus trainings, you know, how to support students on the school vans and school buses, how to maintain safety, um, how to help, the, help them regulate on the way to school. Um, this year we're excited to roll out um, in the next couple weeks sensory carts. Um, we've been able to purchase, you'll see our nice, our nice spirit wear here. Every year we do run a spirit wear sale um, at York Suburban that we put out to the community. Um, so with those profits we were able to buy uh, sensory carts for all the buildings that not just our students access, but general education students as well, with and without autism. Uh, just good practice. Another super exciting thing that I'm super excited about is Autism Cohort. This was something we created this year. Um, and it came out of the need just for Liz and myself to kind of advance our program um, with colleagues who have similar years of experience as us. This is year 20 for me. Um, quite a long time. Most of them have been here at York Suburban. Um, so what we've done is we've coordinated with Dallas Town, West York, and Spring Grove for this school year um, and the coming years um, where we meet with special ed directors, we meet with behavior specialists, um, internal coaches, and department chairs where we can problem solve our most toughest cases. Um, we can collaborate with curriculums. They have been super helpful for us, I think, looking ahead multiple years at secondary uh, education for our students, um, outreaches into the community, and just forming those beginning partnerships. So I'm super excited about this. Um, we meet quarterly right now, um, so I do know it's something we plan on continuing. So really awesome opportunity. This was something I like to put in all of my presentations for, for students with autism, and it's just one of the goals that, you know, York Suburban has and has had. Um, not something I think when I stood here six years ago asking for more autistic support classrooms that we, we didn't meet that goal. Um, I think kids were safe. I don't think they were connected and I don't think they were quite respected within the district, um, which was one of my talking points when I asked for additional classrooms. Um, however, in the last seven years, I think we've definitely achieved this um, and I think we've definitely exceeded that. Um, how greater access to that curriculum um, not only students, but our teachers as well. Um, we're able to get in there and collaborate with gen, or gen ed teachers. Um, we're able to adapt that curriculum for our students so they have greater access. The teachers, like I said, through trainings and just collaboration, they are now independently adapting material for our students. Um, they're implementing interventions on their own. Our kids are needing less support in the gen ed classroom because the teachers have increased their skills. Um, so it's been phenomenal to watch. 
a really exciting thing, oh, you're good, is the Sequest instruction. Um, one of the struggles that a lot of districts have who don't have an in-house program is they don't have that vertical collaboration. So meaning I can't from Valley View collaborate with Indian Rock um, because you never know where your students are going to land. But here, since we've brought back that program, we can easily say, you know, these are your students, these are the needs, and this is the skills we need to transfer to you. Um, so it has been phenomenal to meet at the minimum monthly um, with our colleagues just to kind of plan that sequence for the kiddos. Um, the best thing, and this was my talking point six years ago, I still say it to this day, the best reason we brought back this program was for the kids. My kids and my families needed a home. Um, they didn't, they were so tired of coming to kindergarten in one school district and going to first grade in another school district. And they would be like, well, where's my friends? Well, I don't know. Anywhere in three counties. Um, I, I think even I underestimated the impact that would have on our families, their participation in the district. It's been amazing. Um, some amazing things our kiddos were doing. And in the upcoming pictures, you're going to see that. Um, they're participating in band. They're participating in chorus. That is something until seven years ago did not happen. Um, I can say that with a certainty because I was here. Um, they, field trips, that's another one. It sounds so simple, but that was not always available to our most needy kids, and now it is. Um, building celebrations, the fun runs, the everything we do, the track days, um, all of our kids are included just like everyone else. Their parents come. They cheer them on as York Suburban residents um, and families. So the connections the kids have made is amazing. They have friendships in their neighborhoods. Um, they ride buses. We've never had so many students on regular school buses. And it sounds so simple, but when you look at families just struggling to, to blend in and have friendships, um, the little things really matter. Cool. This is a quote. I also love this one. Um, this is one of my mentors did this quote, and it's the quality of life an individual with a disability and his acceptance and participation in the community in which he resides are as important as academic growth. And I think that's where we started here at York Suburban with bringing this back was, was getting that for our kids, acceptance, participation. Um, now we're getting on that other side that's really fun, and now we're getting to that academics. Um, our children have been the most successful they've been in 20 years. Um, our teachers have been the most successful. We have students transitioning out of our program at rates like I have not seen here at York Suburban in 20 years. Um, our students are going to learning support. They're going to intensive learning support. And anytime we can get them in a least restrictive environment, it's better for them. Um, it greatly increases their chances of success as they, go, as they grow up. Um, so I'm, I'm super excited about that. And here is our awesome slideshow. So I'm going to stop talking, and I hope you guys enjoy the rest. It's quite a bit, but it's a good time. These are students from kindergarten through fifth grade. Um, actually, there are some, I think, actually up till eighth grade. I had some parents give me those. So hopefully, hopefully you enjoy. Let me get out of the way. Thanks. Don't go far. Yeah, don't go far. No, <laughs>
once again, this is why we do what we do. <laughs> I'm sorry, I keep saying that tonight, but it's so true. Yeah. And I'll just insert my, if we're passing medals out, we're talking two gold medals yeah, for Missy and Liz. Absolutely. Where, where, this program is where it is because of these individuals, and they are absolutely phenomenal. Whether they're working with students or they're working with the adults that we see needing necessary training to make this happen. Um, the success of this program is in big part because of the work they're doing. We had four this school year. We had one that moved out, and then we have another one. Actually, we had one. We had Dallas Town contact us today to say, "Hey, do you have room for a student?" So we're constantly. Northeastern uses our program. Dallas Town uses our program. Um, so. You know, we're expanding. Um, one thing that we're very excited about is actually the students that are currently at Indian Rock. We have three students that are aging up to the middle school, and we're able to provide services at the middle school for those students as well. So that classroom will be opening up um, this fall. It depends on our numbers a lot of times. I, I know that um, we do have a student that's from Northeastern that's been with us for three, two years, um, and he will be returning to Northeastern because he will be aging up until he'll be a third grader. But we, um, it depends on our numbers. It depends on you know their numbers. I know Dallas Town right now has eight classrooms, completely full. So anything, anytime someone moves in, they're reaching out to other districts to find placements for them. Ellen, use your mic if you would. Yeah, no, no, it's okay. I know, I know. No, it's just important to know how long these students actually stay with us you right. know, after they make the connections. Thank you. I yeah, sure. yeah. And I can speak to that a little bit. Um, I, I think it's a case-by-case -case basis. We've been going on like as long how long they stay. Okay. But the relationships we've been able to make, and Liz and I in our you know, young years here have made many kind of, I think, relationships where we have friends in many districts um, and colleagues that we respect. So it's really, it's really broken down some barriers to reach out for our students who they might service, um, but also for their students that we service that we can call them. The collaboration is very smooth, um, very smooth with emails, phone calls. Um, there's very little red tape. Well, that um, helps so the continuum. Absolutely. Then, you know, these, kids Just, get used to want, these kids get used to, you know, one teacher or one right. method. And obviously yes. it makes it easier if they can continue those kinds of things. Yes, and that's one thing that the cohort's been really great about is we all run very similar programs, right. um, but we do use different curriculums. So it's been great for us to kind of mm -hmm. coordinate that and um, see what has been successful pilots in other p classrooms and programs that we might want to implement here. Um, you know, if we find a deficit with our instruction, they might have found it. Cool. Um, so it's, it's been a really Good. great, really Good. great tool. To Just that. to clarify, this discussion is, is we have our in-house autistic support classrooms, and if we are not full with York Suburban students, we sell, so to speak, those seats to neighboring school districts who have need. So that's the, I just, for anybody who may not be familiar, that's, that's the way it works. But if I could just offer my observation, the love and the unique skill set that you ladies bring, your, your passion comes through loud and clear. And, you know, we, we thank you for that, for that service and for bringing your program and sharing your program with us because otherwise we don't, 
you know, we don't get to see that. And that's, again, I, I keep saying this, but that's why we do what we do. And you are, you know, the the best cheerleaders we, we could need. So thank you very much from, from all of us. We appreciate that. Again, the love and the special skill set you bring, it's just, it it's screaming to me. So thanks. Thank you. I did have a question. Oh, oh um, sorry. Sure. <laughs> Actually, I, I didn't mean to wrap it up without that. Sure. Um, I think it might have been a mo- about a month ago we had a discussion in one of our meetings about the support we have uh, on both sides of the district. So I want to make sure um, that we cover that a little bit tonight. I want to point out that our artistic support classrooms are only offered at Valley View and Indian Rock when it comes to K-5. Yeah. And uh, our behavioral support classes are East York and Yorkshire. My, yeah. Yeah. Emotional support, sorry. Um, so, and occasionally we have families that choose not to send their child to the opposite building. So let's say a student has been diagnosed with autism, they would normally have gone to East York. We offer them that spot at Indian Rock and they sh- choose not to accept it. Uh, and they keep them at East York. If and when that happens, do we offer, when I'm looking at the trainings that we're offering, do we offer any of that in that scenario and that support for the student is still okay? Yes, I can say in the last seven years, I've, I cannot say I've been to East York, um, but I have been to Yorkshire mm-hmm. on multiple occasions and talked to the whole faculty. Um, I've also gone just to consult for some tough cases, um, not just with autism, but behaviorally as well um, over the past few years. And my hope is that we don't get those calls for East York because we get that buy-in and we get that success at the early levels. So they're more than happy to go to Indian Rock yeah. um, just to continue to be successful. So, sure. Yeah. Thank you. And again, I'll say just as they're walking out, the leadership part of that is really important because the reason why it's happening in other districts is they're reaching out to, to our crew. And there's a couple more questions. Yes, yeah, Sophia, yeah. did you have a question or comment? I just had a comment. I'm a teaching assistant at Valley View now. And there's a student that uses these services, and I can say that I know this student feels that it's their safe place, and all the time, whenever the student needs anything, that's exactly where the student will lead me, because they feel safe there. So I think that's lovely. Oh, that's good. Thank you for sharing that. That's probably the assessment tool you'll ever want right there. That about sums yep. it up. Yeah, yeah. Thank Dr. you very Norfie. much, ladies. And I just have one comment from the personnel committee. We do have an opening for a K to two autistic support teacher to join this fantastic team. There you go. So anyone out there looking for a position, uh, I I would definitely consider applying. It's a great place to be. And that's great. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. The next item I report this evening is the administration recommends board approval of the recommendation for the expulsion of student ID number 7147288319 following a hearing conducted by the board appointed hearing officer, Dr. Rebecca Lorfink. The recommendation is a response to the violation of the York Suburban Code of Conduct and Policy 227 of the district. Seeking a motion and discussion, please. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Any votes to the contrary? Any abstentions? Hearing none, this can be recorded as a unanimous roll call vote. Thank you. And the next item I have is uh, um, an expression of thanks. Um, many of the great things that are happening are the result of gifts and, and those that are willing to provide time and as well as financial donations. And three in this evening, uh, the Orcs Suburban Band Parents Association donated $100 to the High School Student Council for Minithon, which we know is coming up this Friday, as Ms. Collette had shared. Uh, the Edgar P. Cable Foundation Engineering Society of York donated $500 to the High School TSA for their conference sponsorship. ALGEJA Incorporated, which is Crimson American Grill, donated $500 to the high school TSA as well. And that concludes my report. Okay, anything for Dr. Krauser? Thanks very much. Uh, business office report, Mrs. Mrs. Chichuli is with us remotely. Hi, Mrs. Chichuli. Good evening, Madam President. I have several items for discussion and consideration for the April 29, 2024 board meeting. The first item is a recommendation for the board to approve the real property tax exemption certificate for the parcel that you see before you, which has a face amount of $3,870.08 under the Pennsylvania State Veterans Commission for Real Estate Tax Exemption, effective February 7th of 2024. Any, any comment? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. The second item is a similar um, 
motion and recommendation from the administration should we want to discuss it. I'm not seeing any indication of discussion, so feel free to proceed. Okay. Item number three is an annual agreement, and this agreement is a recommendation from the administration for the board to approve the associated business agreement with Family First Health Corporation effective 9-1-24 through 6-1 of 25. Uh, this is to provide state mandated dental screenings for grades kindergarten, third and seventh grade at a cost of $375 per session. There is no increase over the current year. I have a question. Okay, here we've got a couple of questions with that. I have it on. I promise I have it on. Okay, have to use it. go for it, Mrs. Um, actually, how many of these um, uh, uh, examinations do we actually uh, perform per year, and how do we find out about them? Who needs this service? I believe uh, Mrs. Campbell is in the audience today, but we average about uh, 50 to 75 screenings. How we're notified, uh, Mrs. Campbell, do you have the answer to that? She's coming right up. Sure. So all of our students are pr provided with information about the dental exams. Um, as of March 11th, we had we have they have seen um, 72 students and provided them with 97 individual services through the school district, but every parent is, has an open, um, has the ability to schedule appointments for their children. Is this based on economic need or student, no? Is this based on student need? Um, many times students that don't return dental forms from their home dentist or their private dentist, we will reach out to those families and make sure that they're on our list to see our uh, dentists. Thank you. Steve? Thank you. Um, just for my own edification, I'm happy to take this offline. Um, the what's the difference between it? what's what's offered in a session? Is a session four hygienists on site for four hours? Is it eight people for eight hours? Is it what is what's what's a session? So typically, what they do is they see all the students on the list for screenings, and then from that list, they'll decide if they're able to pro to provide services. A lot of the students that have severe needs such as cavities that need teeth pulled, they will refer those on to a dentist. But this is more pre preventative work such as they can use sealant on teeth, they can um, provide support so they, their, their teeth don't get worse in the interim. Mrs. N. Martin, sure. This is not a question but a comment. Um, I've seen the work that Family First Health does in my own school and they do a phenomenal job. Like they come in with the works as a whole crew set up, see the whole grade, like at a time. It's they're pretty swift with how they proceed the um their services and then they give the get the kids like they would at a regular dentist a goodie bag, so to speak, with all the essentials for their health, their dental health and oral hygiene. And they also like take that time to educate the students like how to brush and um, how to take care of their teeth, um, which is very important. So I think they do a phenomenal job, and that price per session is well worth it. I'm not questioning that, and I certainly, you know, I, I figure no, a lot I'm of times these are students that. that don't yeah. have, you know, what are, listen, going back 100 years when I was in school, we had a hygienist come in, right. you know, and check you whether no, you understood. saw a dentist on your own or not. You know? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I had a, a question that Mrs. Campbell, I don't know that may perhaps would be helpful to the public. This is mandated. She said with a question mark at the end of her statement. Yes, it yes. is mandated. We have to collect both uh, dental records as well as health physical forms from all students based on specific grades. But I guess my real question is the state says we as a school district must provide this service. Correct, yes. Right. And they don't provide the funds to pay for it. I think I can safely say that. That is correct. Okay. I just, again, I think it, we're Not all about. In that, that, that avenue, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Anything else for that uh, item number three? Okay, Mrs. Chichuli, I think that's the end of our questions. Okay. Um, item number four is a recommendation from the administration to approve the agreement for professional services with WellSpan. EMS LLC 
to provide curriculum and technical support for the district's emergency medical technician and fire services, pathways to first responders and healthcare certification courses for the 24-25 school year. The total cost will be $800 per student. It will be funded through the grants and the curriculum and instruction budget. And I'm going to ask um, my colleague, Dr. Furman, to provide some information for the board. She's standing at the ready. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. And I'd like to say thank you for those of you who stuck around to uh, hear more about this program because I'm very excited about it. Um, oh. <laughs> I'll go out of it and go back to the First of all, I have, um, this is Mr. Chad Deerdorf with me. He's in charge of emergency medical services with Wellspan EMS. Um, and he was a trooper sitting out there. In the yes, thank you for doing so. Thank you, yes. I kept giving him an out, but he's in it to win it with us. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Alrighty, so if you recall in the fall we presented the concept or the idea for this course and got your blessing to move forward with trying to develop it and see what we could shake out. And so I just want, I, I'm excited to share with you that as this program was put in the high school course catalog, um, well, first of all, we had two teachers who wanted to go and get their EMT certifications because we needed to have affiliate instructors, affiliate instructors on staff. Um, on top of that, then, you know, we've been working, trying to find the best partner for a long-term sustainable future for this program and for our students. Um, as we headed down that track, Dr. Ellis felt confident enough that we could put the course in the course catalog for high school students. And if, for those of you who were attending board meetings in May of 2023, Dr. Ellis made a fantastic presentation about how our students, we have this misconception that the majority of York suburban students desire a, a, four, a pathway to a four-year degree. And he did a deep dive into our data and, and it was very evident that that's not what all of our students want. It's not what all of our students need. And so, um, this course checks all of the boxes for all of our students. And so he put it in the course catalog, and, and as I'm out there shaking down trees for money and talking to people and, and different things like this, they're like, well, what would you call a successful first year? And I said, if I, this is two periods in a high school student's seven period day. And I said, if, if I can get six kids to sign up and commit for this, I, I, I would call it a win and we'll grow it from there. And so um, you can see with the slide behind me, 58 students, juniors and seniors, signed up that they wanted to take this course. Wow. The, um, the teachers at the high school did a fantastic job of, of um, talking to students in reality, with all of the realities of what this could do for them, their futures, and different uh, pieces like that. Um, the number dropped down to 44 because we did have to apply in, in attendance, as we said in the prerequisites when I shared it as a new course proposal in December. We talked about how a, attendance is going to be important um, and, and mandatory. And, and so we applied that 90% attendance rate. That took the numbers down a little bit more. I have to say Chief Hoff of York Area United Fire and Rescue has been a partner in this with me from the beginning. Like when I sent the email out about just the concepts and the ideas, he jumped on immediately. He has been my partner. Um, he goes with me when I, I go and speak to donors. Uh, we, he, he's just been a, a great help. When I told him there were 58 students, he was like, well, we have to come up with something for those remaining students. What are we going to do for them? And I'm like, I don't know, Chief, but we'll come up with something. <laughs> um, and he's also committed as a part of this course. Um, he and his officers want to come in and talk to the students about career pathways within their department, as well as um, he has a number of state certified instructors that are members of, of his department that also want to um, assist with anything hands-on that they can do, um, as well as potentially for other students um, additional certifications. So to that end, let me talk to you a little bit specifically about our WellSpan friends and, and that WellSpan partnership. Um, Mr. James Weber, who couldn't be with us this evening, he's creating the curriculum materials for us. 
And what makes this partnership with Wellspan unique from us just signing on with a, a university or a school is that Wellspan wants to be our partner. For, for what we're paying them for the per student cost, they're going to assist our young and newly accredited teachers with the instructional techniques. But Wellspan recognizes that this is, this is a pipeline for future employees for them at all levels. And so they realize, we realize that if we work together, that we can strengthen our community, that we can, that, that we can grow it, we can build it. And so the curricular materials that Mr. Weber is developing for us, Wellspan knows like at most like that this partnership is, is going to be a potentially a three year, I, the contracts for one year, but, but, it, <laughs> but the goal is that within three years, we become self-sustaining. And unlike a, a college or a university, if we were to buy their services, they hold the, int the, the, the intellectual rights to, to, the, to the materials, to the curriculum, where Wellspan has said that at, at the end of this cycle, if we can get our accreditation from the Department of Health, that we can keep all of those curricular materials. So it, it, is, a, it is a true investment that comes as, as a part of that fee. And I have to say, Mr. Weber, as I was doing my cyber stalking of him, he is the emergency management specialist with the District of Columbia Department of Health. And in 2023, his program had a 94.4% pass rate. So we're, we're, this isn't a fly-by-night operation. Like We are working really hard to put all of the things in place to make sure that every, all of our students our teachers, and that Wellspan can be successful with this. Is it a federal department of health or is it a state? The program? Yeah. The, the yeah, the, that'll be a state one, oh. yes. Be it for the PA Department of Health. For us to earn our accreditation, yeah, yeah. yep. And really, from what I've heard, there are a number of high schools who already have this accreditation. The, where our big handicap is, where our big hardship is going to be, you have to have an extensive equipment cache that I have the list here that I've, I've priced it out. My bad. <laughs> and it is, it is potentially fifty-five to sixty thousand dollars worth of equipment. But I'm a very determined person, and there are lots of people who want to help us. And so I'm confident that if you give me the grace of of three years, that I will do everything I possibly can, and I have a lot of support in the high school. There are a lot of people who want to see this work that that we could do that. But Mr. Deardorff is here in case you have any questions specific to that contract or about the partnership or any of those different pieces. Thanks for the presentation. Um, for that curriculum that will be passed on to YS school district after the accreditation. What happens if we don't get that accreditation? If we're not accredited? My my layperson educator understanding of it is we need to be under an, somebody's Department of Health approved umbrella. Okay. So if we didn't check those necessary boxes and those necessary steps, then I'm sure Mr. Deardorff would want to continue to partner with us, but I'm not so sure that we could continue to sustain paying $800 per student, whereas that, that would be what we would get back once we became an accredited. It would simply be the $104 currently, the, the, the national certification testing costs. Okay, and that, that was going to be my next is question. It, is you. it conceivable to, to summarize what is involved in this accreditation process? I mean, are we talking an extensive, oh my gosh, can we really do this kind of thing? Or because we're good doobies and do what we're supposed to do, we'll get the accreditation. I'm just curious how this works. It is It is a lengthy process, but it's not out of the realm of possibilities for you That's to what easily I'm after. obtain yeah. it. I mean, it's, we will work with you for those three years. Um, again, contracts one, I know. <laughs> no, I understand. Um, but yeah, it, it's it is a very easy step-by-step um, -step checklist. Um, depending on what level you want to be at, um, they have the checklist here up through ALS providers, which obviously we're looking at the BLS level um, for the National Registry ENT right. 
curriculum. So it's not uh, out of the realm of possibilities. And I will say with uh, James, um, he is a PRN employee for us. Um, and he has committed his time, and we actually dedicated his hours to this program. Um, and he, prior to going to D.C., he was overseeing the curriculum for Hack. So, um, and in my previous life, um, prior to Wellspan, I worked with James um, for, for York City's program uh, to help us get some of the um, items in there through Hack as well. Thank you. Mrs. Fryer? Um Yeah, I just had a question on the ongoing instructors that you're going to have. Um, the two teachers are fresh out of EMT class and having taken that class and taught that class for 15 years takes a lot of experience in order to be able to teach those skills. Um, who else is going to be there on a daily basis teaching these? We have our own in-house uh, instructors as well mm -hmm. that we're going to be partnering with the okay. instructors from the, the school district and kind of leading them down the right path on how to how to teach the curriculum. Okay. Um, I believe the contract, if you go to the final page of it, I believe the contract states that it's 140 hours, but that is yeah. off the top of my head and I don't have it printed out in front of me. Okay. Thank you. And then one follow-up, has Wellspan, since it's a new curriculum that they're building for YS, have you guys done this for other districts that have been? I know you mentioned previously you guys have done your James has. Okay. Um, through I mean it's the National Registry EMT program, okay. um, but we're we're breaking it apart to meet the the needs of the school district. So he does he did submit a um, draft curriculum right now or schedule, um, you know, and obviously that's that has room to change and you know whatever we need to do to make that happen for the school district itself. Thank you. Did you? One more question. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, do who's going to cover the $104 cost after we get accredited? Is that going to be passed to the students, or is the district still going to cover that? So these are decisions that we're going to have to make as a district and as a board moving forward as we put a greater emphasis on, on credentialing and certification opportunities for our students. Within this three-year window, you know, as Ms. Trywick point, pointed out, like this is, this is a national certification and exam. This is very intense work. And, and while I have every confidence in the world in, in the two instructors and our partnership with Wellspan, I in good conscience just could not charge students at this point in time. But once we vet everything out, once we get everything in motion, these are important decisions that we'll have to make together as far as what we want that future to be because I, I don't want, th this isn't the end of the road. The, I, there are other there are other opportunities for us to work with our community, to strengthen our community, and to imply to 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 provide employment, enrollment, and enlistment opportunities for all of our students. This is just the first of more to come. Ellen, just uh, a, a logistics kind of thing. Grading in this course, they're taking two periods a day. That's ten periods a week. Is this the normal grading system as the, the high school has? It would be graded. Um, I believe, Dr. Ellis, I, we landed on a 1.0, not weighted but as anything extra. It'll count 90 as an elective. 90 to 100 or whatever it is. Right. There'll be quizzes and different checkpoints yeah. along the way. Okay. Just so that the kids don't lose track of what they're doing and think this is, you know, all skills and no. You know, you've got to pass a test here, folks. I know that. And you've got to pass CPR and all that kind of stuff. So I, I just want to know. Sure. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Okay. That's right. The uh, two instructors, um, they had a, a meeting with the 58 students who signed up because mm -hmm. they were very honest, very straightforward, sure. and very direct because there are some kids who are just really good at playing the game of school. Mm -hmm. And they just show up and they don't necessarily do their homework because they think the teacher's going to cover it and, and just, you know, just kind of, you know, massage in the system there a little bit. But we made it perfectly clear to the students that, that this is going to require oh, attendance. Yeah. It's going to require a lot of hard work during the school day. It's going to require practice outside. But at the same time, like we do at York Suburban, we made sure the kids knew that if, if they're committed to it, there's going to be a lot of supports to help them sure. through and, and to be 
I just want to make sure it's a reality, you know, that, that how we're, how they're going to be graded because this is a very different kind of thing that they're going to be. It's heavily. And Mrs. Green, she was very yeah, real yeah, with them. Yeah, but it's you know it's uh, a very skilled oriented type thing. So thank you, Sophia. I just wanted to ask in the course catalog it says that it's weighted 1.1. Is that accurate? <laughs> I would definitely go with the course catalog okay. over me speaking at the mic without notes. Just out of curiosity. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? And by the way, Dr. Furman, your your tenacity and determination is why we love you. So, so uh, it's all good. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Back to you, Mrs. Julie. Item number five. Um, is an operational agreement uh, for the middle school yearbooks. So the administration recommends the board approve a th three year contract or service agreement with Tyler Publishing Company um, beginning of the school year of 24 25. No indication of any questions. <laughs> Item number six um, is administration recommendation for the board to approve the estimate with Smart Futures to purchase a career planning and portfolio platform for students in grades 6 through 12 to align with the Pennsylvania academic standards for career education for the 24-25 school year. And I would like to defer to Dr. Lorfink and Mrs. Campbell for this item. Mrs. Campbell, you're on. So currently we do have a program that we're using K-12, um, but this program here actually is a program that is specific for Pennsylvania standards. It's a, pro, it's a company out of um, Pittsburgh, and they only work with schools in Pennsylvania, so they're specifically lined to our standards. Also, the cost of this is about a third of what the program that we're currently using is. And the hope is that this coming school year, we start using it with grades 6 through 12, and then the following year, we will take that um, kindergarten through 12th grade. Will that cost increase if we cover K through 12 then? Yes, okay. but for next school year, we're only doing 6 through 12, but I actually have them giving us access for K to 12, um, just kind of bargaining that we can actually get in there and start playing around with it for our students from kindergarten to fifth grade. Okay, thank you. So do we have that figure? Am I missing something? Oh, there's a link. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Mrs. Chichuli, you're on. Item number seven is also an administration recommendation for the board to approve the 60-month lease with Higher Information Group um, at a monthly rate of $1,879.17 beginning August 1st of 2024. This lease represents 33% reduction in print and copying costs for the district. The anticipated savings is over the 60 months is $224,356. I want to just thank Mr. Henry for providing context because that was very helpful for the, how that number came about, and that's a great savings. Um, I did have a few questions. Knowing that Mr. Henry is not here, I don't expect answers to them all now. Later is fine. Um, but in looking at the reduction in copiers that we're getting, which I appreciate. Um, I did notice um, that the rate for printing is going down, which is great. One question is, how many of those copiers have the ability to print in color? Is it all of them, or is it one per building? Um, because there might be additional cost savings there. Might be, I'm not sure. Um, and in any of those buildings where we're moving the location, are, do we already have network drops, or do those need to be installed? I would assume they've already, yeah, okay, good, because um, that would be a huge cost. And do we now or will we have the ability, if we don't already, have the ability to track who is printing and how many pages? Awesome. Um, students can or cannot print? They can. They can from their own devices. And I did notice in the agreement that there is a section on moving those devices. So has there been a mention between that company and us yet about the possibility of those needing to move buildings when we're looking at our consolidation plan? They have. Okay. And, and, I, and I, 
I'm almost 100% positive the changeover from right now because of the age of the machines, you have one machine that runs color and black and white and the other machine that does not. I think the reason the combination is the newer machines, one machine that has the capacity to sort, collate, staple can also run color. In yeah. the past, those larger machines did not do both. But I'll get a confirmation from Mr. Henry to your question about the reduction of those machines. Does it mean one isolated machine doesn't do color? Right, and I know just from personal experience, when color is available, color is used. Sure. <laughs> and and, and yeah. as always, this comes with the educational component relative to, to the adults. Print one color versus printing printing color copies versus printing one copy and then copying color, all those offset sets. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's yeah. it. Okay. Um, will teachers be limited to how much they can print with this new um, arrangement? At this point, there is not, uh, except that the awareness teachers know of how many how many copies they're copying each time. Yeah, they have access to that information. Okay. But I'll get a confirmation from Mr. Henry. Anybody else? Thirty-three percent reduction in printing and copying costs. So we always like that when that comes across the table. Thank you, um, Mrs. Chichuli. Back to you. The last item is a board recommendation to approve what is actually three amendments to the professional services agreement with Crabtree, Warbaugh and Associates. The first amendment is for Crabtree directly uh, to add the intermediate school project. It's the terms and conditions. Um, the fee will be a lump sum fee based on 5.5% of the, uh, the total cost. The second is um, an amendment to include the geotech. Uh, you see the cost of a lump sum of 14,000 with a markup of 10% for a total fee of 15,400. And we will amend the motion for the vote on the 29th to include uh, the third amendment, which is for civil engineering that begins on page 17 of the PDF. Total lump sum is 248695 with a 10% markup for a total fee of 273565 There is one last um, amendment that will be included for the intermediate school, which we do not have available today, and that is for the food service consultation. And I'll take questions. Mrs. San Martin. Yes. What is what is the ten percent markup for? Well, as uh, Mr. Wentz is also here, oh. if if necessary. Mr. Wentz is here. <laughs> is it? Uh, yeah. Please do. Mr. Wentz just kind of snuck in the side there. We're going to have him comment on the ten percent instruction. Yeah, that's standard across all contracts at Crabtree. Um, it's for managing the consultants. Um, so we actually go out, we manage the contracts, we manage their billings, uh, we actually verify their work. So we go through the process. When they sell, send us a bill, we don't send it directly to the school district. We actually make sure that they've completed that stage of work. Um, so it's all the, the processing that goes along with that. Follow-up question. Is this 10% markup going to happen like monthly, quarterly, or is this a one-time deal? Uh, it is billed against the percentage of the contract, so it would be a 10% towards that percentage of completion. So if they're going through and they're saying we finished 20% uh, of design development, that would be built into that uh, invoice at that time. Does that make sense? So there's an overall contract sum, and let's say they're billing 20% of a certain phase of that, that uh, contract. It would be billed against the entire sum of the contract based on that completion of work. So your question is, it could be, it could be monthly. Depends how their billable is, am I correct? We'll be get, receiving uh, invoices on a monthly basis, yes. Uh -huh. So yeah, it'll be passed way. through based on Um, 
one point of context here, this was all built into the number for that all-inclusive number for the school. These are not in addition to those, uh, those items. Um, I will point out that the Crabtree fee, when I was asked if there was, uh, you know, 6% was a design fee, and we're coming at it in at 5.5. The reason for that, I was specifically asked if civil engineering was a part of that contract. Um, the way that these contracts are structured, and I did not have the, uh, the base agreement with me from 2023 when we were doing the last capital improvements project, um, the way they are structured is there are actually supplemental services that are outside the basic services, and civil is one of those supplemental services. So to do this as an amendment to the original contract, we reduced our fee to stay accurate to what we had said in that meeting. So Crabtree's fee is 5.5%. Um, the total still comes out to 6%. It's because the civil, these other supplemental services, civil, geotech, and food service are uh, outside of the Crabtree fee then. Still all coming in at the 6%. Thank you for that clarification. Anyone else? Sure. So for these um, amendments, do we anticipate any additional ones? I mean, I know that's hard to say. Yeah, the only one that we don't have in our hands right now is the food service consultant. It's okay. just too early in the design process to really pull them in. Okay. Um, but we are vet vetting proposals right now. So we have RFPs out. Um, and again, that goes through to the district as cost savings. If we're able to get a better, more advantageous price, that's not something we're profiting on. That's something that goes straight through to you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you for being here. Mrs. Chichuli? That concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on on the agenda, Academic Standards and Curriculum Committee, Dr. Sullivan. Thank you. I'll recognize Dr. Furman to um, continue with her presentation. So for tonight's final installment of the Intermediate Realignment um, and Educational Programming Series, I wanted to focus on the efficiencies of staffing. So as always, let's start with a quick review. In January, Series 1, or the first part of the series, we talked about how the planned program is the backbone of teaching and learning, everything that I do and the heart of what a school district should be. In February, we focused on discussing how intentionally designed learning spaces can facilitate modern learning standards and goals and help to prepare students for their futures. Last month, I talked about how intermediate uh, realignment could equalize opportunity and access for all students in grades three through five. Tonight, what I want to do for the efficiency of staffing is dive deeper into some of our historical data. And so what I pulled together um, with this chart, it focuses on last school year. Yeah. Thanks, Mrs. Potts. And so the top half of the chart is what enrollment looked like at East York and Indian Rock in October. And for many of you who were on the board and attending meetings at that time, if you recall, Indian Rock had an influx of students in their attendance zone in August up through the first quarter of the school year. Third grade was particularly hard hit with large numbers of enrollments um, beyond anything that we had seen in the past. And so part of showing you this chart is if you look at that top half, if you look at the October enrollment there, you would see that a consolidated school district that we could have maintained those nine teachers and had an average class size of 24 students. It's not ideal by our class guidelines, but it is certainly manageable and, and, and teachers have, have managed many more students than that. What we had, to, what, what the board chose to do is they chose to add a fifth teacher to manage those class sizes at Indian Rock because we just couldn't snap our fingers and consolidate. So the bottom half of that chart takes a look at our enrollment then in April and just kind of fleshes out just some of the transiency within the district. I thought you might be interested in seeing some of those numbers of, of the comings and goings at all grade levels. Um, but the point of this is the consolidation 
helps with those ebbs and flows of student enrollment. Consolidation would help us to balance class sizes more equitably. Um, as you look at that list and, and see that just the different numbers of students that could be in any teacher's classroom on average in the district. But I didn't want to, so, so that was just last year and that was fresh. So then my next question was, I just wanted to dig a little bit deeper. And my next question was then, well, what does third grade look like historically for us as a school district? And so then that's the final slide for you that I have tonight. Um, and it, it is just interesting uh, how, how the numbers, different waves, if you will, whether it be on the east side and then to the west side. And every time we change those numbers, this isn't necessarily, most often it's not adding staff. What's happening here with this efficiency of staffing is to balance the class sizes, we're forced to move teachers. We're forced to move people who are, have comfortably taught a particular grade level, worked with teammates for a number of years, and then you know, we have to make the tough decision sometimes of, of who, who is going to move to third grade so that those numbers are more manageable as, as a larger bubble of students go through, if you will. So it's not just about the class size for students and that learning environment for them. It's also about maximizing our teachers' knowledge and, and what they put into honing their craft. Sometimes people, just, people enjoy the change and floating back and forth, and other times these are really tough decision, or discussions that, that principals have to have with their staff, um, with their different teammates in the springtime. So in conclusion for tonight's part of the series, intermediate realignment would allow us to balance class sizes and to use our staff more efficiently. I had a question. I don't know if you can answer this question. I really don't know who can answer this question. But PA certifications go pre-K-4 and then 4-8. We also have a very veteran staff. So we have a number of staff and who are who have the old K-6. Got it. That was my question. Like, how do you move folks if the overlap is only in fourth grade? It, it, was, it was a good question. And I'm thankful I could answer. Others? Thank you, Dr. Furman. That concludes my report. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Fryrick, anything from the Communications Committee? No report tonight. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to Mr. Robinson and the Personnel Committee report. Thank you, Madam President. You have before you the Personnel Report. Would any board member like any of these items considered separately, or are there any questions on any of these items? If not, the Chair moves approval of the below-mentioned items. Is there a second? Second. Any votes to the contrary? Any abstentions? Hearing none, this can be considered a unanimous roll call vote. And before I conclude my report, it pains me to draw your attention to the number of retirements we have within the district. Not only are we losing Dr. Gregory Gully, but also Mr. Michael Seipel, and Hazel Price, all three of these individuals demonstrate the dedication and service of many years standing that is unheard of these days. People don't stick around in jobs the way they used to, but they do at York Suburban. So i just like to express my sadness that they're leaving us, but wish them the very best in their future endeavors. If there are no questions, that concludes my report. We do have another one. Uh, oh, we have another one. We have a, another item. We have another item. Uh, the, recommend, uh, the administration recommends the replacement of the coordinator of communications and administrative services position with the executive assistant to the superintendent position. Down move. Second. Any discussion? Any votes to the contrary? Any abstentions? Hearing none, this can be recorded as a roll call vote. 
Mrs. Frerich, you look like your wheels are turning. Yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to make note that not only do we have Michael Seip and Hazel Price, we also had Linda Knopp retire this year after 20-some years. So we have over 50 years of custodial staffing alone that we wow. are losing this year. 38, 38 for Mrs. Knopp. Yes, Ms. 38. Knopp, yeah. So it's well over 50. It's closer to 60, which I think is truly amazing. I mean, they've seen a lot of changes in how you clean floors and do a lot of other things. So uh, we're indebted to these people, really. They keep the house clean every night. Indebted is a good word for that. That's that's true. Couldn't have put it better myself, Mrs. Fryrick. I just wanted to acknowledge Dr. Gully, because I couldn't. I could not, right? Um, as an Indian Rock parent of one student who was lucky enough to go through the building with him, and a younger that won't. Um, <laughs> I have, I know the administration has tried to keep him every time I have seen him over the last few years. I've mentioned it. Um, so I knew it was coming. Sad to see it happen. Happy for him. Um, that building has a lot of memories in it. And, you know, it's really hard to consider that building going away, Dr. Gully going away. Um, but he's really the reason, I think, for me at least that I have the memories I have. The building didn't make those memories. Dr. Gully and his staff did. Um, and we are still keeping that staff, of course, and I know we will continue um, educating those students in the best possible way. But Dr. Gully, for me, is um, it's a great loss for a district, but very, very happy for him um, and excited to see what else he does when he's done here with us. There you go. Wishing him, wishing him the best. Thank you for that, Ashley. Thank you. I want to echo those sentiments. Um, I've had three children go through Indian Rock, and Dr. Gully has been tremendous for all of them. And I know they will miss him. We will miss him, and we wish him well in his endeavors. But we want to just say thank you a million times. <laughs> Yep, absolutely. He'll forevermore be known as the world's greatest fifth grade teacher at my house. That's that's how old I am. Uh goes back to his uh his uh classroom days and uh you know, he left us for a bit and uh we went to a neighboring school district and learned the administrative trade and then uh we were fortunate to to bring him back and it, as you say that establishment of that community and I think so many people have have mentioned to me since the news came out I've had several people say to me that it's it's the community that that he has uh that he has created so uh yeah we 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 wish him the best and you know I mean I highly recommend retirement myself so uh <laughs> so uh we 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 do wish him well and uh you know wherever he lands that's our loss just one quick um uh, item we did the consent agenda for for a we went through it we have the motion we have the second we just need the final resolution uh -oh. that's there yep just to uh, uh -oh. see if there was any any of anyone against no, all good we moved on to a b right away you're good that's, that's my fault so yes yes so i'm doing i'm i just need for a which was the consent agenda one uh -oh. through Oh, oh, oh. Six that we just need the final agreement i to apologize say that, yeah. we have the motion we have the second is there discussion any votes to the contrary? Any any abstentions? Hearing none can be recorded as a unanimous roll call vote. Perfect. Thank you. My apologies. See, this Dr. Gully thing got me all wound up. And it's got us all wound up. And, and, and I can say, certainly, having been on the group to go see Dr. Gully and hire Dr. Gully, we have a long history. Um, the great news is he's not leaving us tomorrow. We still have him for quite some time. We're going to capitalize on his expertise uh, and really help with the transition. So as we move through these next stages this week, we're going to get some new information out um, to prepare that long-term plan to make sure that the Indian Rock staff, the students in the community have a, have a very succinct plan to make sure where we're, we're capitalizing on the greatness of Dr. Gully and moving us forward in a positive direction. Mr. Robinson, I apologize. I've messed your report up completely. That's so. quite all right, <laughs> Madam President. If there are no other comments, going once, <laughs> twice, that concludes my report. Okay. Mr. Desai, Property and Finance. Uh, no report for this evening. Our next Property and Finance meeting is on April 15th at 5 p.m., here. 4.15, 5 o'clock, right here. That's right. That concludes my report. Thank you.
Hopefully everybody else will they'll have done their taxes before they get here. Oh yeah, that's right. These meetings run long. You don't have to minor meet. details. Yeah. Mrs. Fryrick. Okay. Uh, yeah. Not a whole lot. Uh, under the Lincoln Intermediate, you have the highlights uh, are attached for the board meeting held on April 2nd to give you an idea of what's going on out at the LIU. And I have no report from the uh, G uh, Joint Operating Authority. That concludes my Lincoln Intermediate report. And York Adams Academy, you have the highlights from our March 26th meeting. Um, and other than the highlights, I have no other report. Thank you. Mr. Robinson, you're back up for a legislative report, I believe. Thank you, Madam President. Well, today, April 8th, Advocacy Day, what kind of a day was it? A day like all days, filled with the events that alter and illuminate our time. And York Suburban, I am proud to say, was there. And we conducted several frank, serious, and spirited discussions with our local representatives. And I am pleased to say one of those representatives is in the audience this evening. I'm hoping it's because she enjoyed the experience quite as much as we did. Ain't that right, Representative Fink? Okay, thank you. And without further ado, I will defer to my colleagues for their perspectives on the experience today. It was an experience. <laughs> Um, no, for me, it was my first advocacy day, um, so I, I sat back a bit and let Mr. Robinson lead the way most of the time, um, but it was, it was great to be able to sit down with each representative who represents some portion of our district and our state senator, and um, to meet them in person, be able to have a few minutes, um, probably 15, 20 minutes, I'd say, we had with each, each of them. Um, and really discuss not just topics that impact our district, but all of the districts in the Commonwealth. Um, actually, one of the representatives we met with um, apparently only represents a street in this district that doesn't have any residents. So I said, well, good news. Everything I want to talk to you about has to do with all the districts you do have residents in. Um, and the, the point we really wanted to drive home was specifically the cyber charter reform um, and to me, it seems like a topic I think it's easy to kind of agree on. We, our cyber schools don't need the same amount of money as our brick and mortar. Um, and we also reiterated that we weren't there to talk badly on cyber charter or charter. I know I personally, and I shared this with our representatives, have friends that have used both modes of education. Everybody has different needs, and I respect that. Um, but when it comes to things like us having to raise taxes to pay for our operational budget or pay for our construction. These little things add up, and this is just one thing that could save us over $800,000. Um, and we, PSBA, was nice enough to give us a list of all of the districts um, in the county that those representatives represented so that they had that as a takeaway um, and all of the information to keep. And um, I'm not sure you know, how many other districts were up there. There were probably, I think they said maybe a hundred of us. It didn't look like a hundred of us, but you know, it was a good amount of people. So all in all, I think it was a good day and look forward to the next one. Madam President. Yeah, I, I, I also enjoyed um, participating in advocacy day uh, today. It's, I, I relish the idea of singing the praises of public education in whatever uh, capacity that you know is is before me, um, and and it's always a pleasure to see democracy in action. That in some cases you graciously agree to disagree. You look somebody in the eye and say, "Well, I see it differently," and uh, agree to disagree and sort of salute and march on, so to speak. Um, and and being a part of that and seeing uh, democracy in action was, you know, it was a trek up to Harrisburg and a trek back, and there was a traffic jam, but we got back in time for the eclipse, and um, it, was, it was time well spent, and, you know, thanks to PSBA for organizing it and uh, for the uh, legislative community, our representatives, and our state senator for making the time to to sit down with us and it, you know looking us in the eye and saying you know sure we 
we we can help you there or gee sorry I see it differently and acknowledging that that's the way it goes thank you madam president let me just add at first I was sorely disappointed because attendance was off there were only about 100 or 110 folks there today whereas in years gone by there have been more than 250 the plus side was we had all of our state representatives and state senator to ourselves for each session so that we could engage in a detailed discussion. And if there's one takeaway I would like to, to add to the statements of my colleagues, because I could not agree more, the, the opportunity to talk with them individually was invaluable. But it takes more than one trip a year up to Harrisburg. I think it's incumbent upon us as a board to meet with our local representatives more often. And that's something I, I look forward to. And I hope Representative Fink, you're happy to hear. We hope to visit you soon and often. <coughs> Thank you very much. So on, on that note, uh, a good time was had by all. I want to congratulate my colleagues for putting up with my sound system in the Volvo on the way back. And I'm sure they'll never listen to a bagpipe CD again as long as they live. That concludes my report. That was the highlight, I must admit. Um, thank you, Rich, for leading us up there and, and being such a stellar chauffeur and for your report. There we go. Mrs. Chichuli, do you have a York Adams Tax Bureau report? No report. Thank you. Uh, as far as the um, York County School of Technology, I encourage you all to take a minute and read the mini board report that you have linked uh, from a report uh, based upon our last meeting uh, held at the end of March. A couple of highlights that I just wanted to, to share with you. We had a very interesting um, program, uh, the program highlight at our last meeting was all about the engineering and advanced manufacturing um, shop. They call them shops. This is the, the student uh, focus in engineer, engineering and advanced manufacturing. Um, I was amazed at how really technical this is, what a high level uh, of math and science is required for the students in this um, program. They they showed us examples of the robots and the drones and all the various industry tools that uh, students in this program um, use and it's it's just uh, amazing to me the the uh, the things that that these students learn and again similarly to what Dr. Furman was talking about they're able to to walk out of the school with you know, a certification in a specific area, a specific field. So um, that it's just always interesting. So they, they work on educating the JOC members, and this was the, uh, the program highlight. Uh, I'd also like to share with you that we had a York Suburban, one of our own uh, York Suburban students, who was recognized uh, in March as a student of the month. He is in the medical professions program. Uh, Rehan Zahid is his name, and it's sort of our tradition to send him a note of congratulations from uh, the board and the administration. So we were proud to uh, to hear that. And I also wanted to share, in case any of you might be interested, particularly in um, younger members, they are doing their musical coming up uh, April 19, 20, and 21, and they're doing uh, SpongeBob, the SpongeBob musical. So they're very excited about it. You know, they haven't had a, a music program at the School of Technology, I don't know, four or five years prior to that. They had no music courses. So um, that leadership has really done a lot in incorporating uh, students who – uh, have a, an interest in music. Obviously, their focuses are elsewhere, but the whole idea of being a well-rounded student and participating in uh, 
choir and instrumental music and certainly a musical. So if you have any interest, check it out, uh, the York County School of Technology website uh, to go see the SpongeBob musical. So. And, and kudos to the former YS employee that they took to help build that music program. <laughs> we just, can still just her saying. a little bit, can't we? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you know, I guess it's all all fair in love and war, huh? Um, all right, so that, unless there are questions, um, that concludes uh, my report on the School of Technology. Um, and once again, we'd like to thank all our visitors this evening. You have a link to upcoming events uh, and our committee and board meeting schedules is also linked there. Uh, and this brings us to our final opportunity for public comment. Same rules apply, all comments and questions addressed to the president. Board and staff will not normally respond. Um, comments will be limited at the discretion of the president to five minutes or less. Are there any takers for public comment this evening? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Dan Barker, Spring and Spirit Township. Madam uh, President, I uh, agree with you that I highly recommend environment until a local district decides to build a monstrosity in your backyard and your wife becomes unhappy. And my, when my wife asks me to do something, I usually do. And she asked me to become a watchdog, and so here I am. I was really surprised. Uh, I think it's item, it would be called item uh, 8B on the agenda tonight. The administration recommended, I th and you passed, the replacement of the coordinator of communication administration services position with the executive assistant of the superintendent position. Given um, it is not personal, Scott, um, but given the failure of once that the board has followed the state's directives and delegated the responsibilities for communication according to your policy to you and your office. And that has been a massive failure over the last 10 years. We've got one decade of proof. Yes, postcard was sent out. Yes, a couple of articles were put in the paper. That does not meet the requirements of that policy line. Quite frankly, sir, if I was you, I would amend that sucker right away because it's a problem for you. And it's a problem for the past superintendents and the past administrative people that <clears throat> this bulldog isn't gonna let go of. On the comments tonight on the website, um, one of the first ones was, I oppose the renovation project and I believe taxpayer deserve transparency. That's your problem. That's the problem. That's why you've got an overflowing room here and outside. And the problem's not going to go away because we are active. And you've been asking for that. And uh, along the way, there's words used. And it's, uh, it's disconcerting, some of them that are used. Equitable is a word that shows up in the description of the project. You chase equitable out a little bit, a little bit it leads to impartiality. That leads to favoring no one side or party more than the other. Well, there's no doubt, it's an uh, incontrovertible fact that the, uh, there's been favor placed away from the residents in this process. Integrity was mentioned by one of the longtime attenders, apparently, in the context of the community interaction from the, the residents that are unhappy with the way things are going. I'm not here to stop this project. It's not my objective. I don't like what I see when I look at the state law, when I look at the Constitution, when I look at the policy manual, and I look at the way that you're operating the, the district. And it's on specific points. And integrity is one of them. Integrity, Mr. Mrs. Madam President, is not telling a local resident when she has a problem with the noise that's going to be created in her backyard that you will make sure, do what you can do to make sure that construction doesn't start until 10 o'clock each day. Now, is it? It's nonsense. Anybody who speak it knows it. 
I read an article from a uh, retired board member that was entitled Beware of Disinfo About York Renovation Projects. When you drill down into the article, you see the word disinformation. I'll use it. Thank you. And disinformation is dis is by no means what the article will talk about. It is the deliberate, definitively, false information leaked by a government as to confuse another nation's intelligence operations. Come on, people, use your you're involved in a scholastic activity. At least be scholastic. Don't use terms of accus accusing people of being charlatans, of being village idiots. It's unacceptable. It, it, it takes you down a path that definitively puts you in a brand called a hostile board, a body corporate that has become warlike and characteristic of an enemy. Thank you. Melissa Stewart, Hollywood Terrace, um, Spring Garden Township. I just have a procedural question. Going forward, it is very apparent that there is going to be a large number of people at these meetings. And I know that once a meeting is advertised by state law, it needs to be held in the location that it was advertised. What can we do? How far in advance? How can we get these meetings, the school board, the planning commission, the property meetings? How can we get them moved to like the cafeteria or the auditorium? or a larger venue so that all the people can be accommodated. How is that? I don't know how that's handled. Yeah, we, we don't normally answer questions. If you have a specific question, we can, Dr. Krause can reach out. Okay, thank you. Sure, thank you. Thanks again from Scransbury Township. Thank you for bringing that up because, uh, once again, I was going to ask that question. When can we know that it can be moved to the cafeteria? I don't think it's a trick question, and I, you probably know the answer. Would you like to tell us right now, or do you want to not speak again? Yeah, it's just not normal procedure. We'll work on it and... Well, it will be posted. Okay. I do want to say that um, I just want to be on the record about that. And also, um, Mrs. Schroeder, I hope you love our tenacity and determination, too. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Bellavo with Springus Perry Township. Um, I would like to say it was very sad to see that concerned citizens are coming forward because people are going to be losing their homes. They were disparaged tonight by name at this at this board meeting. It was very sad to see that that the taxpayers cannot speak and they're disparaged because. But this board, as we said before, was elected by the taxpayers. And I would like to say also it was very interesting tonight to hear the wonderful presentation of your educational program, which proves it can be done in the buildings that are already there. And you do not need a $120 million project to continue the excellence in education. And you mentioned Harrisburg, and I'm glad you did. And I think Representative Fink might be able to um, affirm this, that there are, uh, there are millions and millions of dollars of, of leftover COVID money that were in the state this year that were put in program, millions of dollars, leftover money, that they didn't know what to do with. And they put it in programs that uh, show no outcome or are not worthwhile at all. And there are programs in Harrisburg that um, – show no outcome and there that can be replaced that money could be replaced to come to the school systems and i know for a fact and i talked to dr krauser about that at the last meeting that they put a lot of money unfortunately into the philadelphia school system and they don't show anything any outcome from the large amount of money that is sent to philadelphia 
So I, I would urge right now that, um, that the school board would join the taxpayers and our representatives and have a press conference in Harrisburg and that we could use the money, that this school board could use extra money, not for the new building project, but to renovate, not renovate a big renovation, but to fix any problems in the existing program and it, not to put the shovel. You don't need a shovel uh, to the ground in this new project. I am asking that that, that, pro that project does not stop, start right now because we can, do the, we can have the educational program that you presented tonight, which was excellent. In the, you're doing it right now in the buildings that are present, in the present buildings. So why do we need this project that is not sustainable by the taxpayers and people are going to be losing their homes? So I would invite you to join the taxpayers that are concerned about losing their homes. And I mentioned my neighbor, for one, from Ukraine, and many other people that are saying this, to go to have a press conference in Harrisburg with our representatives and to take a look at the programs there and that the, this, this money can be put to, toward the York Suburban and other school systems that are not receiving equal treatment as far as state money goes. And that money could be used to fix any of the present buildings that need to be fixed. Um, so I would, I would like to put that proposal forward. And I, I don't know if Representative Fink um, has anything to say about the, the programs there. I'm sure the extra money or, the, or the, where that extra COVID money went. There were millions of dollars, I know for a fact, that were left over. So um, I would like to see if I'd be willing to go with you, help you do it. Um, so join us. Join the taxpayers as a school board. This program, this project is not sustainable. We cannot afford more taxes. Mm -hmm. All right, I just want to say that, again, that, um, that it was very disconcerting. Uh, we need a town hall meeting. There is so much mis mis Every time I look around, I'm hearing another bit of misinformation. So the people don't have the truth. We're asking for truth and transparency and integrity. And this school board needs to listen to the taxpayers. We can't do it. It's not sustainable. It's fixable by fixing the buildings presently there. If you proved it tonight. You, had, you, you presented an excellent program with the buildings that are here. You do not need a new uh, um, multi-million dollar project. And I thank you for your attention. And I, I, I do pray that you consider this and let's join together with the taxpayers. Maybe we, maybe we can make a difference in Harrisburg in the way they operate. And maybe the programs that they have now, they need to show outcome and not just be throwing money at all these projects and these different programs in Harrisburg when the, when the people that have these programs don't have to show the legislators anything as to concerning what they're doing with the money or the outcome. Thank you very so much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Any other public comments this evening? <clears throat> Thank you very much for giving me a second time. I wanted to um, finish with what I didn't have um, delivered before. I also want to let you know I timed myself and I was at 4.30, but um, when I get in front of a board like this, I think it's important to slow my speech down so that um, it, it doesn't, it's not hurried. This is how I would, I like to end my comments uh, that I had earlier. To the Board and Administration, I remain deeply thankful for your thoughtful and committed service to public education. I have the privilege of knowing each of you and the value that you are people of integrity, and I value that you are people of integrity. I appreciate how much you prepare for meetings and that you ask excellent questions. And I know that you take your responsibilities extremely seriously. I fully trust we are in good hands 
as you contemplate the decisions before you, you have proven yourselves and you have full confidence from this community that your decisions will be balanced for the good of our community and for our children's future. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Any member of the board have anything to bring for the good of the order? I just wanted to add, um, this Friday, past Friday, the um, Indian Rock had the Jungle Book musical, ah. and that was, the team did a fantastic job. Um, I don't know if it was recorded or not, but seeing it live, it was really good. So cool. It was adorable. I heard about that. I'm glad, it, I'm glad it was a success. That's good. I'd forgotten, though. Thank you. Anybody else? Just for the public's awareness, the ESSER funds that were issued during COVID will expire in September of 2024. Thank you. Last shot, anything else from the good of the board? Okay, we can stand adjourned then. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody. Wasn't it?